we have with us Christian Meyer from the Center for Vermont Regional Planning Commission. We have the select board. That sounds we, good. Okay. Uh, we have Theo yes. Kennedy. Yes, it does. Sandy Levine. I think that's, now we've got two <laughs> Liz Sharps. Really? Can you hear yeah. me now? Yes, yes I'm home. there. I'm okay. home, everybody. Good. We're glad. Very <laughs> glad. That Chinese was very difficult to interpret. So, um, uh, do we have any uh, amendments to the agenda? No. Okay. So, with that, I'm going to uh, call a public hearing to order to solicit input on compiling an application for a $60,000 grant from the Vermont Community Development Program that would be used to assess the needs of the town hall, including ADA compliance, various structural, electrical, and mechanical improvements action possible. Uh, and Liz, I'm hoping you're gonna lead the way on this. Yeah, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Thank okay. Um, and I can't see who's here. Christian, are you here? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so this this is um, an application for a grant that uh, the town of Middlesex is applying for um, that would help us uh, determine sort of the the fate and future of the town hall in particular. Um, and uh, we had been talking with Christian who had been helping us, as you all recall, with our um, CIP process, the, um, the capital improvement planning process. And one of the takeaways from that process was um, the, um, you know, that, that, that we realized that our next step would be to actually do a in-depth study of the town hall. Um, and in order to do that, in order to present to the voters, um, oh. can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, all the, in order for us to um, consider options for the town hall, we really needed a professional um, assessment and options would include things like um, reviewing, doing an entire engineering study of the building, uh, everything from sort of, you know, soup to nuts or nuts to bolts, however it is you say it, um, looking at things like the structure, um, the, the, um, the weatherization, the plumbing and heating systems, um, and uh, in, you know, all er, anything related to the existing building and bringing it not just to the 21st century, but to like 2022 standards um, in terms of efficiency um, and, and safety. Um, and, you know, and that would also include an assessment of, you know, the existing elevator and a compliance and all of that. Um, this study would also include seeing the building. Um, that we can present to the voters. So um, is it moving the building or building an entire new building and finding a new space for it? Is it finding an existing space and turning that into a town hall? So there's, there's various um, things that will happen in this, in this study. But we can't, we can't do this study without grant is for. Um, it's probably not gonna be 60,000 that we apply for, um, it's looking like it's possibly closer to 45,000. Um, it is um, it's a 10% match of which in kind um, can be applied to that match. And I think we have a pretty good, um, I haven't communicated this with Christian yet, but we have a pretty good um, uh, offer of in kind work for a weatherization on the building. Recording um, in for, progress. Sorry. Okay, yep. And, um, and so this, this uh, we're currently in the process, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, AKA Christian Meyer, who's here today, um, has been uh, largely uh, in charge and, and writing this grant for us. Um, so he's been working with Peter, Sandy, Levine, and me 
um, to help us pull together this application that we believe is in the best interest of the townspeople to um, to apply for this money, which, um, like I said, was we think is going to be closer to forty five thousand. That will do all of the the engineering study and the um, alternative locations for um, for the town hall, so that we can present to voters. Um, some options that they can look at if we are even going to do that, if we're even going to, you know, decide to, to do something, you know, imminently with the town hall. Um, so we're really asking the public um, for approval in this, this grant application. And Christian, is there anything that you feel you need to add that I kind of left out or? No, I think you did a very good job summarizing. I just want to throw in one note that was a driver of uh they alluded out, which was the idea that needing to get that public input during the planning process as well, during the study as well, uh, guided by a public vision to help develop the purpose of this facility in the community. Okay. So, um, I mean, I guess, are there, I'm not sure exactly what to do next in this process of this public hearing, but is there, are there people here who came to actually ask questions about this? Uh, Barbara, are you here to weigh in on this? No, not that's not the topic I'm uh, here to weigh in on, but thanks okay. for asking. You're the only person I didn't recognize. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, so what we need to do tonight is the town needs to, and we have a Sarah sent us out the form that we need to sign supporting uh, this grant application. I have the darn thing right here. Now I can't find it. Here it is. Is that the resolution or? Yes, the resolution. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so once we get everyone that a, signed. Does everyone have a chance to quickly look at that? Did anybody have any questions about it? Peter, there was yes. one paper, I don't know if it was on the resolution or there was something on another one, but it listed you as the grant administrator. Um, I just want you to know, are you are the one that's going to be going into the portal and handling all this and signing off on all the bills or? No, that is not the case. That's going to be Liz. So why did well, that's then, there? Then that should change. If that well, hold on, Dorinda. There, we the had only to, thing I picked up on. Okay. Yeah, Christian is still. So the grant hasn't been completed yet, and we just met with Christian on Monday to assign roles. And so, what you're seeing, I believe, is that we had to add Peter as the CEO, which is stands for Chief Elected Official, not Chief <laughs> Operating Officer or whatever. I was ready to ask uh, for a pay raise. <laughs> <laughs> And so his name was added specifically for that role, but no, he's not going to be, it's going to be, I think, um, so one of the things that's going to be slightly different about this grant, Dorinda, is that um, we're writing in um, C Central Mount Regional Planning Commission as the grant administrator, they can get paid out of this grant to administer it. So there's certain things that they're going to be doing, like kind of overseeing the, you know, like making sure that the engineering company is hired. I think that's the kind of thing that they'll do. But I will do similar to what I did with um, the CIP grant in terms of approving the invoices, writing the program reports that are due so that we can get paid if it's the same system. I'm not sure exactly how this grant works, but but so that's, um, and that will be spelled out in the grant. Um, now I will also... Okay. Um, explain that this is a very competitive grant. There's a good chance that we won't get it, but it's not because of how it's written or what we're asking for. Um, this money is prioritized for low um, income communities, of which we are not. Um, however, we have um, in the grant, we are um, exploring a an option of um, having there be some sort of um, if, if you know if there's a different town clerk's office or a different structure to our town clerk's office 
to having a place where we might be able to do uh, a small food shelf like we did in the church. But since the church is no longer there, um, a community building that benefits low income communities um, gets some more points. It does not hold us to putting in a food shelf, um, but it just, we speak to the fact that our food shelf was shut down during COVID and then subsequently burned. Um, so that this could be a potential space. And no, Sarah, you're not going to start handing out food. So don't worry about that. <laughs> so I guess the other the other piece of that this to think about is, uh, and I always like to be optimistic and think we're going to get things we apply for. But if in fact if in fact we are not successful with this grant application, we're going to need to figure out what next steps are because we are going to need, I mean, do we need necessarily $40,000 worth of help? I don't know, but we're going to need some professional help to evaluate our, our options and decisions going forward with the, with the town hall situation, but we got to take it one step at a time. So this is just the first, uh, this is just the first step. And so do we have to, in this public hearing, do some sort of motion or just sign that resolution? Do we have to well, move I think, anything? I think at the conclude my my read on this, and maybe I'm wrong, but my read on this is that we have the public hearing, we solicit input, and there's basically no one from the public here. So there's that. Then we adjourn the, the public hearing or conclude the public hearing, and then uh, the select board votes to approve signing the resolution. Okay. I would think. Does that sound right to you, Sarah? That sounds right to me. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I guess the the situation is now. Do, does anyone else, board members, any anyone else participating in the mo in this uh, meeting, have anything else to say or ask or question about this? Yes, Sarah. So. Uh it sounds like $45,000, is that gonna be enough to do all this like an engineering study? And uh, you know, it just seems like, an, it seems like a pretty low number. Well, um, so we are just so you know, having someone else look at the budget to see if it makes sense. Cause Christian said, you know, he'd gotten these numbers from Du Bois um, and King. Is that correct, Christian? You had asked them what an engineering study would cost for that. Yeah, it's a mix of, it's a mix of stuff. Um, so when we first started talking about this as part of the capital improvement program, I did reach out into Bois, to Du Bois and King, and they gave an estimate for just the, um, the mechanical electrical plumbing of somewhere between five and 8,000. There's other things involved in this, like the energy uh, audit or um, the efficiency audit, the public outreach, um, some architectural services. So we think we're close, um, but but it'll be helpful to get other professionals who have maybe worked on more architectural projects in the past. Um, I'm a transportation planner by, by trait. And so when we say the term, just so you guys know, at this very moment in time, the grant isn't due until what, June? Is that right, um, Christian? The gr so we'll submit next week and the... Oh, they, okay. They, then, the, then the meeting, the, the final, that's our target date. And then the fine, if there's little bits and pieces, we, I'm sure adjustments can be made. It's not a hard deadline. It's a June meeting of the, uh, of their board of directors that then. Okay. Votes on okay. and prioritizes projects. Okay. And or, so, yeah. yeah. So we still have time just so you guys know the maximum that we can apply for is 60,000. And, you know, with these kinds of grants, you don't want to just apply for 60 just because you can, you have to show what you're going to, you know, why you're going to apply for that. Um, so we're going to, you know, I, I'll talk with Christian again, just to make sure that we've covered our, um, our bases in terms of, um, you know, like, for example, do we have in the grant uh, funding for someone to give us a quote on what a new building would be? Yeah. Um, and, you know, um, I don't think there's really any buildings in town that we can identify. So I think it's probably more like a new building someplace else um, or fixing up our existing building. State police um, barracks. Don't forget the state police Well, barracks. I thought we just heard something about the police barracks. Did you, Sarah? Yeah. They, uh, they, 
the the governor's office called back, asked for more information, and um, okay. you know I had to dig out the deed, and they're taking it to the governor supposedly this week. Oh, okay. So who knows? I mean, that would all I'm saying is that would be the one uh, that would be right. the one potential building we've identified. Right. So um, you know we'll review the budget again, and you know make sure that we are you know being true to our costs. Because you're right, Sarah. We don't want to. Do go over on this um, and have to pay for something that we could have gotten in a grant. So, all right. I also think, I, I mean, this this might not give us the final answer, but if it narrows down the it narrows down the options, it'll be well worth it. Like if we if we know that okay, the best thing for us to do is renovate the existing town hall then we may need to do additional work. Who knows what we'll need to do. But if we, if we get over that first step about, about what the best path is, that'll be big. And it's been really great that we had this CIP done because that, that puts us in a better, that gives us more leverage. It takes us seriously, right? That we really are you know, doing our due diligence for the voters. Um, so, you know, there's, I think we have a lot, we have a lot more strengths in this grant, wouldn't you say, Christian, than we do sort of weaknesses in terms of, um, you know, and it also depends on who else is applying in this round too, doesn't it, Christian? Like what else applications they're seeing? Yeah, that's abso absolutely right. They have, they allocate, I think, 30% for these planning studies, 30% of their, um, uh, block grant funds go to these uh, planning studies. So if there are some really strong programs, studies out there that are really targeted on, you know, let's say low, low income housing, that's by the nature of the program going to score higher than a public facility, which serves everybody, um, but may not target a certain group. Gotcha. Any questions, anyone? Have you all had a chance to, I mean, the, this, uh, this resolution is pretty much, I, I read it through, there's nothing, uh, nothing scary in there. It's just laying out the facts, basically. Um, has everybody had a chance to look at that? Or have most of you had a chance to look at it? Okay. Is someone willing to uh, make a motion that we approve that resolution? Wait, do we have to close the public hearing first? Did you say? Yes, we should probably close the public hearing. I'm sorry. So I'll, I'll declare the I'll declare the public hearing closed. Thank you, Christian, for coming. Yes, thank you, Christian. Great, thanks. Motion, please. Uh, so moved that we approve the resolution to apply for um, the VCDP grant for planning study on the town hall. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, all in favor of the of the motion to approve a resolution to apply for a VCDP grant application. All those in favor, say aye, raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so we all need to sign this, right, Liz? Uh, yeah, I think so. If we can, I mean, I would say at least a quorum. I okay, I was... I was down there today and it wasn't in the wasn't in the yellow envelope, but I can stop by in the next day or so. Well, you hadn't you hadn't approved it yet. Yes, we did. No, but when before the forget it. <laughs> but when you were there today. <laughs> correct. You hadn't approved what I'm saying is that we have it. don't you yes. have to approve it I before we it. all I sign it. it? I get it. Yep, I know. I know. Keep me straight. All all right. the visits. I love visiting the town hall. Um, I'll be there tomorrow to sign it because we do. Right. So we really, so you guys, it's serious. Like you have to go to the town hall this week to sign it because it's got to get uploaded into the grant application. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. Considering appointments to fill three vacant lister positions, action likely, and we have uh, three resumes. Yes. We do. So I've talked to all these people at length. I've talked to other people at length as well, but they did not submit resumes. But these are people who uh, 
Gary Waring, who is a retired doctor of medicine, which is interesting. Um, and he just, he's interested in, in keeping active and he seems of course intelligent. And Annette Halaz, who also seems of course intelligent. She's a nurse. If anybody has a heart attack here, we're gonna be in great uh, shape. And um, Shelley Desjardins, who is uh, very computer savvy and uh, is, is, as she said in her note to the uh, select board, would really like to, um, you know, be part of, she's looking, she's, she's involved in the community. Her, both her children have basically have recently moved up here as adults or, and uh, she's would like to give back and become more involved. And um, so that, that's the, that's, those are the three candidates we have there. It's, it's interesting. And I think that um, I think that if they are brought in tonight or whoever you want, I think Eric can, uh, you know, maybe he can be an adjunct lister or he can just help them out and, and do, do a little bit of help because we do have to get some lister certificates done tomorrow. So. I did, uh, I did notice somewhere that there's an upcoming lister training. Okay. I, think well, it was, I can't remember. I think it was the league of cities and towns. Yeah, I think it's. I thought that was last week, but uh, this is this is the hot season, as you know. Uh, I have three people who have non-residential properties in town who need to have them. They do need to have lister certificates so they can fill out their HS one twenty two. So my advice, my, I'm asking the board to not delay. <laughs> we get the message. I'm. I personally am very glad that we have three applicants. So, what I would hope would happen is. Are we, are we allowed to have more than three listers or no? No, we have a board of three. And uh, what you could do is, um, I think what you could, I, I don't know what you can do. I mean, it's, I don't want to, I need Eric to sign off on things tomorrow as fast as possible, like lister certificates. Uh, and then once he's done with that, he can step, I don't know what to do. I, I'm, I, well, I, I think what we, I think what we need to do is enter into some kind of an agreement with them to provide to provide some training for these people and get them up and going. Right. So, uh, you know, my recommendation would be, I guess, that we appoint these three listers and then we enter into whatever we call it, a consulting agreement with with right. Eric, where he, he is no longer a lister, but he's a listing consultant or whatever we're going to call him for some period of time. And pay him at the, at the hourly rig that we agreed for the work that he was doing and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Randy. Um, so Eric gave us a date that he was willing to stay to. Is that, uh, have we had any further conversations with him since he's been doing this? You know, uh, has that date changed? Is, you know, right. where do we stand with Eric? And have, have we even had other conversations with Eric? I've had lots of conversations with Eric. So uh, the, I think the issue is that A, you can't, Eric has, you guys appointed Eric as a lister and you just can't kick him off uh, that, that procedurally that's not going to work. What you're going right. to be able to do is you're going to be able to appoint two people as listers tonight and Eric as the existing lister. And then Eric is going to have to resign and somebody else is going to have to step in. That's yeah. the only, that's the only uh, logical solution. Also, if Eric is going to be signing lister certificates tomorrow or this week, he needs to still be a lister. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what these, I don't know what everybody's schedule is, but I know that everybody's trying to get their income taxes done and their HS-122 is done. So we're really in a tight bond. And, uh, and I don't, and I, you know, Eric has definitely made it, has been very clear that he does not want to stay on. So if you guys could just select two people. He has, just, just to interrupt you for a second. I mean, he has agreed to stay on and do, and do training. Yes, he has. So, we, we didn't know how so, many candidates we were going to get. Right. So, you know, I, I think that's the right approach. And we, we, we obviously have to be delicate picking out which two we appoint, <laughs> which one we defer. But right. the understanding would be within, within probably a couple of months, they would, he would resign and they would be appointed uh, lister, assuming they're still willing. That's correct. I will say that Shelly has been very eager. Um, she's come to the office. She's asked a lot of questions. She's been very eager. I know that I'm just translating what, I mean, obviously all three people are, are smart, intelligent people. I wouldn't worry about any of them. I just know that Shelly's very, very interested. Sarah, Sarah, have you been able to have, I, 
one of the one of the candidates you said something about being, you know, uh, tech savvy or computer savvy. Um, That's the it, conversation I had with Shelly. I mean, when I when Shelly, I said, you know, this is something we need to. We can't we can't start. We you know someone who's just not good at computers. And I've had this conversation with all the candidates. Um, that this is really, it's not, it's not high compute. It's not really super technical stuff, but you do need to feel very comfortable in front of a computer. And, you know, Shelly has done, if you look at her, um, if you look at her uh, resume, you can see that, you know, she's done a lot of, she's been in system manufacturing process specialist. She's obviously dealt with computers and uh, de dealing with software applications and uh, government uh, in, in government property. So, I mean, she's, she's got that kind of, she's got that, she won't be uncomfortable in front of a computer. What about, what about just uh, hearing that these guys are coming from like medical fields and whatnot, except for Shelly. Uh, I'm just curious to understand, like just any, I didn't see any notation of like building experience or experience within buildings at in any way, shape or form amongst any of the three. Did yep. you have any com communications differing from that? No. And I've explained to them and they, you know, they're just, uh, I, I think that they're, my, the impression I got was that they are smart people who are recently retired and would like to get more active in the community. And, um, you know, I, I talked to Eric about this and I said, what did you, I mean, do you have any experience when you did this? He said, I didn't have any experience. I just answered an ad in the paper. So I think that that's just kind of what happens. Um, you know, they're all property owners. So they know they've, they've read tax bills. They know, uh, they know about uh, parcels, but we're starting, we're starting with, um, we're starting with a, a pretty clean slate here. The good news is that we have Marla from Nemrick who is involved and Eric has agreed to stay on. That's why I think that, uh, you know, considering we need official documentation signed this week by Eric, that we shouldn't, we should just say, you should just pick two people and then we can contact the other person and say, when Eric resigns, uh, we would, we would, uh, we would, you know, consider, consider you. I don't know. No, I think, Randy, I think, I think maybe the other piece of this puzzle, because I've been thinking about this since I thought saw these three resumes, um, is right now we've entered into an, a contract for this year to do the inspections. And we will presumably have an opportunity to renew that contract if we need to. So depending on, depending on where we are and how it's going, I think that's going to be the next step in this process is do we need to enter into that contract for another year? And if we do enter into that contract, then it's true they're going to be less for the listers to do, but they'll have plenty of time to get trained up. And if their real role is entering, entering uh, information in the computer system and also participating in tax appeals, that'll be good training for them. But you're right, there's, there isn't a lot of uh, that kind of experience here, in fact, zero. Um, yes, Sarah. Yeah, I think that one of the things we have to consider is, you know, Nemrick is being very flexible. So, and Marla is going to be in the office this week. She's our appraiser. She's going to be office where I'm going to try to get her. I feel like, I feel like I'm the secretary for everything now, um, that we're well, going to try to get these candidates, these new people together with her and with Eric and Eric is, can come in with it anytime, but she's going to be here on the seventh. And um, I think you should consider, you know, putting some money toward Nemrick doing this clerical stuff, such as, you know, typing out the lister certification, taking a non-residential property, turning into a residential property for purposes of tax to, of these HS 122s. So if you guys, I don't know how much money is left in the lister budget for the, for the remaining fiscal year. Do you know Dor Dorinda? No. Um, but I think we're going to have to do that. There's just no way. I mean, Eric doesn't want to do that stuff. Well, it's going to be a little bit of a, excuse my uh, analogy, but it's going to be a little bit of a Chinese dinner approach until we get get uh, people up and trained. But we just can't throw them in the in the seat and say, do this, do that. That is a yeah. We have no experienced lister who has applied for this job. Right. I would say we're lucky to have three people who are interested in doing it. So am I. I that. agree. So. So Sarah, I'm gonna put you on the spot and say of these three, which two would you recommend we appoint tonight? I heard you say, I heard you say. Um, uh, well, I think you should definitely, uh, I think you should definitely uh, do use uh, Shelly because she's got a lot of, uh, 
she's got a lot of on hands computer experience and I'm gonna let you two pick the other two. They're both qualified. I mean, they're both, they're both, you know, equally interesting people. I guess my thought would be, um, I don't know. I knew, I knew uh, Annette's husband, but I don't really know her. And other than that, I don't know either of these other people. So I don't know how we decide. And did you have any I conversations? Only, I guess my only thought would be uh, appoint the two uh, appoint the two ladies, and you know, Gary's been in some pretty high powered positions. Maybe he'd enjoy a few months of peace and quiet before he jumps into the fray. But I don't know whether that's true or not. I don't want I don't want the person who doesn't get selected to now now to feel like they were the third choice. You know. It would be nice if they're going to come in, if they could all come in just to be trained, because uh, there's no point in not having them in, you know, uh, you could, I wonder if there's something like you could say, appoint two of them and then say to the other one, we will appoint you when Eric leaves. But for statutory purposes, we just need, uh, we can only have three listers and we can't dump Eric now because he's got to sign official paperwork. But, you know, it oh, could be- it could be as soon as April 19th, but you, we don't want to want you to miss out on the training. Right. Um, yeah. So is there any way that we can phrase something like uh, in anticipation of Eric's uh, resignation that he is, that we would have, that you point to uh, th all three, two would be active now. And then one would be active upon his resignation. There How's that? I think that's, I think that's perfect. Yeah. And if somebody has got a problem with that, then they can I run for this. Yeah, that's a good I think solution. that's I think that but that's the best we can do, and have them all come in and just explain the situation to them. Yeah. They'll understand. Nobody wants to lose any training uh, time. Mm -hmm. um, and so we will, know. and we will pay them obviously for the training time. Yeah, correct. They just won't be able to sign anything. Right. That's all right. They're uh, blisters of uh, apprentice uh, journey journeyman blisters. Mm. And we had a we had an hourly rate for journeyman listers. We discussed. I don't know. I mean, that's that's not my, it's not my. Well, point. you had you had taken, and when you did the raises, you didn't really. Um, we had one listed at two of them listed at twenty four, and one listed at twenty eight. Um, but they are all coming in as new, so you know. I would assume that. Probably they'd all come in at 24. Yeah, I would think so. That makes sense to everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so who's ready to make that complicated motion, Phil? <laughs> so I, I think I think the only the hesitation that I have is is forecasting that you're going to appoint somebody upon Eric's Eric's you know resignation. And I feel like that should be done separately. Um, if let's just say, you know, we're, we're blessed and some, some experienced, you know, lister comes in and says, you know what, I missed the boat on the last one, but I'm, I'm, I'm here now and I'm interested. Um, I would hate to tie our hands in a future uh, designation at this point in time. So that, that's the hesitation that I have with making a, a complex motion like that is it, it ties your hands now. And I think we can have the conversation with the person that's not, that's not necessarily a, a, appointed at this point. And I think they'll get it. If they're here to, to be more active in the town and to help out because they see the need, I don't see putting off an appointment and for a month and a half or whatever, uh, two months, what, however long Eric's here is gonna is gonna make that a situation where they're like, ah, I'm 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 over it. So I have, I have no problem doing it as two separate things, but I think we do need to agree to hire. I mean, this is this is the tricky part, Randy. Like, we're gonna we're gonna pay this person, so they're gonna participate in the training. We're gonna pay them. So if we're gonna do that, we kind of need to hire them as a whatever we call them, provisional lister or lister in training, or I don't know, I don't know what we call it. So we're, 
we're kind of going down the going down the slippery slope no matter how we do it. No, I, I, I hear that. I hear that. But I, I think that, and maybe I'm oversimplifying this, but couldn't it just be to appoint these two, but to pay for the training for the third with no formal commitment to a point at a later point in time, come in, we'll pay for your training. And, you know, yes, we think that this is where we're going to go. That could be the conversation, but I, I just, I have a, a real hesitance about saying, yes, we are appointing this person upon resignation. Peter. Yes. Uh, I, I do understand what Randy's saying. However, our, our time frame for our lister to be done uh, for Eric out of there is not a long time. I mean, I think we were pretty lucky to have three people come forward uh, how long do you keep this open? And do you, so the way Randy's talking, uh, we're keeping that position open uh, out there and advertising for Lister. So here's a here's a thought, and I'm just and I'm just thinking on the fly. What if we what if we appoint the three of them effective April fifteenth? I mean, there's nothing for them to have them have them come in and meet with the the, the Nimrick lady, but they're they become listers April fifteenth, and at that point, Eric becomes becomes a consultant. Now we can't. I mean, the tricky part in, in this is Eric's our elected lister; he has to resign. So if he says, "Well, I don't want to resign on April fifteenth," I don't know where that leaves us. We can we can only. <laughs> We can only drive certain parts of this uh, ship. It's like we're down in the engine room with our hand on the throttle, but we're not up on the bridge steering. Yes. The other issue is um, Eric's only in the office four hours a week. So unless he's willing to come in more in the next few weeks, <coughs> that is not a lot of training time. Um, to work with these people. I don't know if he has given us a firm deadline or if it's still up in the air, but I mean, I don't know how in four hours a week that you're going to get this training in. Yes, Sarah. Well, I've talked to Marla about Nemerk about this. And again, it was all, everything was so up in the air. We didn't know, but she said, she's going to be in this week. And if we can organize a meeting between these people and her, she will help uh, with the training as well. And Eric too. I mean, th there's so many unknowns here. It's very difficult for me to figure out how to get everything going when I don't know who's a lister, who's where, where Eric's going to be, when Marla's going to be well, here. It's really here's, frustrating. Here's, here's my suggestion. I say, I say we appoint all three of them effective April 15th. That's a random date. I don't even know what day of the week it is. Then you have this meeting with Eric, Marla, and the three of them, and you work that out, and hopefully the training can begin before before April 15th. You'll have a chance to figure out what kind of commitment Eric's willing to give us in terms of doing training, what his real final date is, and all that kind of stuff, and say, so Eric, what this means is, um, if you agree to this, that, that uh, you need to resign April 15th, because there are going to be three new listers. Or maybe we just maybe we just say to the listers, we've got some details to work out. We can't actually appoint appoint you right now, but we're committing to paying for training in anticipation of appointing you, or something like that. I don't know. Yes. Well, we have a statutory issue here. The statutory issue is you need at least two listers. It's a board of listers. So what I would do if I were you guys is I would point, let's say, Gary and Shelley. Okay, Gary, put Gary and Shelley tonight. And then say, Annette, you will be uh, effective uh, April 19th when we will revisit, we'll re revisit the uh, appointment on the night and the meeting of the 19th. But that way, that way we fulfill Randy's situation, which is Annette comes in, you know, if some, if, you know, uh, the lister God drops between here and April 19th and says, I definitely want to be on the board of listers. We can do that. Eric can resign. But this way you have two people who you now have a, as of tonight, you'll have a full board of listers. And we've created, we've met our statutory duty. And so then, we you know, about just the training, say, Annette, you're training, training in the midtime. Do we ask, hold on a second, Randy. 
Do we ask uh, Annette to participate in the training in anticipation of being appointed? Yeah, I think you say, Annette, this is the way, this is our, I would um, just spell it out to everybody and say, sure. in order to fill this, uh, we're not being sneaky about it. We guys got a problem. And obviously Eric's going to quit, but we can't have him quit right now. So, you know, if Annette says, well, screw that. I don't want to do it. I'm not going to come in for training with I'm not sure. Okay, well, then we're done. She's that's it. You know. All right. I agree with that. I, that's fine with me. Randy. So I, I've heard this 19th date a couple different times. Do we have like, is that a date that Eric's given us? Because I was under the impression that, you know, my my reservations and my hesitations were that we didn't really have a set date that he was he was out of here that was two weeks away. Well, There's Eric, select board. He, I'm sorry, it's what next select board meeting? Okay. So has and he Eric, offered a, a letter of resignation with that date on it yet? No, what Eric didn't oh. do, what he said was I'm not going to run. And we begged him to just stay so that we could get some. So when he signed, when he signs these documents, we have somebody because I've had to tell people today, I'm sorry, we don't have any. I don't have any active listers right now. And it's it's creating incredible stress in this office. People can't do so, their taxes. Let me let me try let me try and say this one more one more time. So what we're going to do is we're going to appoint two of the three, whatever the two of the three are tonight. Everybody's going to get together and have a little tea party at the town clerk's office uh, in the next few days with, with Marla and Eric and Sarah. And Sarah's going to lay this out for them. And we're going to hopefully start the training ASAP. But the new listers are not actually going to be appointed until the 19th. Is that what you're suggesting, Sarah? You're suggesting we appoint them now. I'm suggesting now. you appoint two now so that two can come in and sign oaths tomorrow when you have a full board of listers and we're done. Okay. And then yeah. it, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to email all of them and say, here's what happened. Here are the, here's the situation. Marla, Eric, meet with these listers because these new listers, because we got to get this ball going and get it off my shoulders because I've spent more time trying to find listers than I've done anything else in the past two weeks. Yeah. All right. And I think we have to get a date certain for Merrick for his resignation. Yep. Right. Okay. Yep. Okay. Now it's somebody else's turn to try and state this motion. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get us going here by making the motion that we appoint Sarah, fill in the names. <laughs> no, 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 no. Nice try. No, no, no. I, I don't know the names. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. We've got Shelly Dejardin, Gary Waring, and Annette Halas. And you suggested Shelly and Gary. Gary. Okay. okay. Um, as a point, uh, a point as listers, Shelly and Gary effective immediately. I'm going to leave it right there. And let the rest of it just happen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is there a second? A second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Okay, Sarah, you're off to the races. Thank you. Well, thank you. Good work. Well, you don't know. Don't thank me when the grand list puts together. Then we'll see. Hey, at least now we have a chance. <laughs> yeah. Okay, moving right along. And now we're, we were ahead of schedule, now we're behind schedule. So uh, treasurer's report addressing uh, ARPA grant requirements, uh, setting a meeting devoted solely to creating a list of ARPA priorities, considering a one-time standard deduction action possible. Uh, Dorinda. Um, yeah, so I had, uh, I attended a seminar on this last week um, and I, sent you guys the link um, with the idea that hopefully somebody else could listen to it. Um, they are suggesting that anybody who's under $10 million take the standard deduction. Right. We have to file our first, um, our first report this month um, before the end of April. 
and we have to declare in that first report uh, whether we anticipate to take the standard deduction or whether we intend to um, go the other route. So um, I just need somebody to say that, and we're gonna be at a zero thing happening anyways, because we've taken no money out of this at all. So um, it's basically just declaring the standard deduction if you so agree. And I don't see any reason not to do that. I didn't listen to the whole thing, but I listened to enough of it and I read the stuff you sent along and I don't see why in the world we wouldn't do the standard deduction that gives us maximum flexibility and minimum responsibility in terms of dealing with this money. Yeah. So, uh, Dorinda is recommending that we do the standard deduction. Do we need a, do we need a motion on that Dorinda? Or can you just do I'd it? I'd like one. Yeah. Okay. Somebody willing to make that motion? Sure. Bill? Yeah. I'll, I'll move that we elect to take the standard deduction, uh, for the, um, ARPA funds and ask the treasurer to file, uh, declare that and file the first report uh, before the end of the month. Yep, perfect. Is there a second? Hello. Randy, thank you. Uh, all in favor of the, of the motion to uh, direct Linda, Dorinda, excuse me, to uh, file our, our first report indicating that we wish to take the standard deduction. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Good. And uh, what about what about a date? I think we did we did decide, and I think it is a good way to start to have one meeting dedicated dedicated solely to this. Uh, I mean, that doesn't mean we can't have we can't do orders, we can't do you know whatever. If we need to appoint another lister on the nineteenth, we could do that, but. Is there any reason we wouldn't do this on the 19th and allow an hour or an hour and a half to uh, discuss this? You already have the fire department, I think, scheduled for that meeting. Okay, but we could we could deal with the fire. Yeah, let's not let's not forget the fire department again. But I think if we say, you know, 20 minutes for the fire department another 15 minutes for whatever else we have to do, then we've got an hour and a half to talk about this. So that would be plenty, I would think, to start the ball rolling. Yeah. Unless anyone disagrees. No, I, I think that's a good idea. We'll suck up the time some way, somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> okay. So Sarah, you, you've got that message, right? Protect that agenda on the 19th like crazy. So forget the fire department. That's the first thing I should do, right? And then no, they're uh, going to be oh, there. Don't forget the fire department. Whatever. Oh, you oh was that was joking. That was yeah. okay. That was town clerk humor. Town clerk humor. Okay. Yes, we'll do a fire department, other business for about twenty minutes, and then we'll spend an hour and a half on the on ARPA. While we're talking about these funds, I would like to suggest that we spend a little bit of this money um, in getting the product that we need to set up the OWL down at the town hall, which is the system that all these towns are using to do remote meetings, because I think it's important that, um, you know, that we have that ready to go. I have a solution. Hello. Sarah has a solution. Okay. There's, okay. This is a solution. Interesting, that's uh, interesting question. I've been talking to organizations who have been using the OWL, Vita being the one I talk to the most, and they find it very difficult to use. It's like all of a sudden there are two meetings going on. There's the meeting going on on Zoom, and then there's the mm -hmm. meeting going on in person. Um, I, I now have reservations about the idea of that whole hybrid thing. The, the one uh, thought that I have heard bantered around is to make it so that people can dial in and listen to the meeting, but they can't participate in the meeting. Or maybe they can listen to the meeting and they can submit uh, questions on the chat or something like that. I'll, I'll get you, Sarah, just a minute. But I am not convinced I've talked, I talked to three or four organizations using, using the OWL and trying to do these hybrid meetings. And 
you know, you got people who have difficulty connecting, you have all kinds of stuff going on, and it's very disorganized and confusing. Now, whether over time people get used to it and it works, I don't know. But I am, I am having originally been the one who said, I think we should consider having hybrid meetings now. All I'm saying is I'm having second thoughts. And I don't know what anybody else has to say about that. Yes, Sarah. I, I had a long conversation with Orca today. Orca will uh, conduct a hybrid meeting for us for free. They will bring in uh, a, cam a, a camera when we, they do the meeting. They will use, um, they'll do the audio and they'll bring in the computer. All we have to do is put up the monitor and I have a TV in my basement that will work. And they sent me a link tonight to show how they do this for other meetings like Bethel. And I think they do it for some school districts and it's gonna cost the town Zippo. And their reaction, their idea is that you conduct the meeting, people can watch the meeting and uh, you can either have an agenda, you can have a time at the end of the meeting for a public comment or people can chat, you know, and say that, you know, put in questions during the meeting and you can choose whether or not to. You're gonna need a facilitator at some point to take over from Orca for the town to say, okay, open it up, Phil, you know, uh, Bob Smith would like to cut to talk, you know, Susan, whatever, but it will cost the town nothing. And you don't have to worry about the org. You don't have to worry about the owl and connecting. Um, and, and it's, it costs us, it's, it, it'll be much more professional. I like that. Well, we could try that. I mean, I, I like the sound of that a lot better than us trying to do it. I can tell you that. Right. They take, they take care of everything. But hold on, just a quick question. You said Whoop, the I'm public sorry, comment. Ahead, I'm just going to say, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, that you're saying that for every meeting, someone would need to monitor the chat? No, I mean, it would, it, it depends on how you guys try to, if you, how, you, if you, how you organize it. You might say to the people tuning in, Look at if you've got questions, we're gonna we'll take it. We'll have a public like a lot of school boards do. We'll have a public participation uh, part, and you can use that, and that minimizes whoever has to monitor the chat because it is kind of difficult if I'm going to do this and take minutes at the same time. But I, I think it can be done. But otherwise, they will. If Peter's talking, they'll take the camera and they'll look at a Peter, and if uh, Steve talks, they'll look at that. If Dorinda talks, they go there. So in other words, it's like having an owl, and you know, all we have to do is get a TV with an HDMI cord, and I've got that. The only question I have, and, and I mean, we, I think we should consider this, but the problem with the public comment is if we've already taken action on what they want to com right. what they want to comment on, that kind of kind of takes the zeal out of it, but. I, I think we should consider this, and I don't think we should talk about it too much tonight because we don't we don't have any time. But uh, and we're not going to talk about it on the nineteenth. Um, I was thinking, I was thinking, or maybe we do talk about it for five minutes on the nineteenth. I don't know, but I that that's good news because that to me solves my biggest reservation. Yes, Dorinda. I think it's more than just select board meetings. By if you had something in place that allow other committees to use this, whether it's the planning commission or the budget committee or whoever, I mean, this is not just select board minutes. This would give all our boards an opportunity to conduct their meetings remotely and have people participate. Are they willing? Are they willing to do this for other select board meetings? Messages. Oh. Sorry, are they willing to do this for all our meetings or just select board meetings? I didn't ask them. I mean, we were just talking about uh, the select board issue. Uh, I know that the ZBA is is not interested uh, is not interested in holding uh, Zoom meetings anymore. Uh, they've caused a lot of problems for them. So they're just going to go back to in-person meetings probably. Well, uh, and I don't know about the planning commission. Could we, could we table this table? This? Sandy, did you have something else to say? Uh, yes, it was similar to what Dorinda raised. I think um, there are, well, the, the planning commission may want to have an opportunity to have hybrid meetings as well. We've discussed 
possibly using an owl. We used it for one meeting because somebody had brought one in um, and it actually worked fairly well for a hybrid meeting. Um, so I would just, you know, if the town is exploring other options, consider that there are other groups that other that conduct business for the town. Well, here's what I'd like to do is table this discussion for tonight. Sarah, you can you can do a little more uh, legwork on this. Uh, you know, it would be it would be a start to do it for the select board meetings and then open up to others if it was available. I, I like the idea of the of the public participation. I just don't want our meetings to be a nightmare. Um, so and I do think, just one, just one last thing. I do think on or about May 1st, it's time to go back to in-person meetings also. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, my understanding from using OWLs is we're gonna have to get a separate computer. I'm not gonna use, I've used my laptop to run Zoom meetings. I'm not gonna use it for any, any more. So, I mean, that's going to be have some do that. Sandy, did you, what did you guys do when you had your OWL for the planning commission? Somebody brought in their own computer. Yeah. I mean, did you, we, but you, you didn't have a monitor, right? Um, I came to one meeting and I brought a monitor with me that I agree. That's cumbersome. Um, you know, if there's a, a better way to ha have it displayed would be particularly if there's people in the room, but the owl was helpful for if there were people, you know, watching and there were some people in the room. So if the town could buy a computer and and uh, and I know you're tabling this, but I just want you guys to think about what we're going to have to do. It's going to be not just an outlay for um, an, an, a, a, um, an owl, but you're going to have to buy another computer as well. And I don't know if we can get around RB Tech with that. Just something you're going to have to consider. Well, uh, th there's where there's where maybe the ARPA funds come in as to run that. Right. Mr. suggested. Yeah. I, I just think we need to do, do some more work on this, but that's good news that they're willing to do that. And even if there was some, some fairly low charge for them to do it for other organizations in town, and it'd be worth doing it. I just think trying to do it ourselves, uh, and it, it all depends on how big the meeting is. I mean, if it's a relatively, relatively small meeting, four or five people and a few people coming in remotely, I think it'd work, work fine. But, uh, if all of a sudden you have, I, I was in a Zoom meeting the other day with 40 people. It was like a complete circus. <laughs> it was crazy. So anyway, um, anything else, uh, Dorinda? I do, but I can table it till the end of the meeting if you want to move on. I can do it under other business. Yeah, that'd, that'd probably be good just because we're... Uh, we're warned for the joint meeting with the planning commission at six and it is just about six. So remind me if I forget that we, uh, we need to come back to you. Other yep. matter. Thank you. Um, okay, joint meeting with the Middlesex planning commission discussing whether to create a development review board to replace a planning commission uh planning commission slash zba action possible uh sandy can you give i mean i i read the the material you sent along thank you very much um but if you could give us this sort of higher uh view look at why we would want to consider doing this um certainly i will i will also say that i warrant i noticed this as a planning commission meeting as well so i would invite all the other planning commission members and note that theo um, Kennedy and Mitch Oshesky are here as well, and they're also planning commission members. So I will guess I'll yep. open this as a planning commission meeting. Um, thank you. This this came up as part of our review of the zoning update. And you know what are are there administrative changes we can make to make you know permitting either you know smoother, easier, um, and certainly one thing that came up a, a, a few. Uh, few permits are both came up that were both reviewed um, by the zoning board of adjustment and then a complete separate review often with the same criteria by the planning commission and so you had 10 people reviewing the same thing for the town and it hasn't happened yet but it certainly could happen that you get you know disparate or different decisions because you have 10 you know two different boards making these decisions other towns have, and then the legislature has allowed the creation of a development review board that would do all of the permitting, all of the zoning permitting for the town. It would just be one board. 
it replaces the zoning board of adjustment and it replaces the planning commission permitting functions. Planning commission would still do zoning updates. We'd still work on the town plan, you know, all the other duties that are in the statute for the planning commission, but the planning commission would no longer have the permitting um, responsibilities. And I will, and I, and it also came up noticing that there's been some difficulty filling positions on many town boards, including the zoning board of adjustment. It certainly led to at least a couple of members of the planning commission saying, this is just too much to do all the planning that we're doing. Plus, you know, often come for permitting hearings as well in the weeks in between, because it's too much to do the, the permitting hearings as well as the, um, the planning work that we've been doing. Um, so we thought that this, you know, we, we discussed it among the planning commission and, you know, what are the pros and cons? I found that article, I think was published by the League of Cities and Towns in the, you know, earlier mid 2000s, because that was around the time that this change was allowed. Um, and it, it set forth the pros and cons. Um, as I see it, it's, a, it's more streamlined. You just have one body that is then able to get some expertise on permitting, um, and for folks who need a permit for something, there's just one um, group that they're having to go before. You don't have to schedule multiple hearings. Um, and the I, cons of it, I suppose, are it's, it's relieving the planning commission of some. The planning commission in Middlesex is an elected body. Um, the development review board would board would. Uh, would always be appointed by the select board. Um, so I, I suppose it might be, so there may be some concerns about that. There may be some concerns that folks want to have, you know, more than one board reviewing their permit, um, you know, just to not give one board too much power. Um, so I think those are, are sort of the pros and the cons. The other thing that came up as the planning commission was talking about it is that <laughs> We have found that it is helpful to have, you know, the input from the planning commission on some permitting. It's certainly been helpful to the planning commission to know what are issues that come up during permitting. Um, so we would, you know, like the, the if, if the select board goes this route, the select board to consider including one, maybe two members of the planning commission as part of the development review board. Um, and perhaps also a select board member as part of the development review board. Um, that's, you know, a, an overall summary. I don't know if Theo or Mitch, if you have other thoughts. I know Mitch works in Northfield where they have a development review board and Theo has some familiarity with this as well. Mitch, are you gonna say anything? No, um, I was giving you a chance, but um, I will- well, you, you go ahead. I think Sandy covered the pros and cons pretty well. Um, as Sandy mentioned, most of you know, I am the zoning administrator in Northfield. They, they use a DRB down there. It seems to work pretty smoothly. In general, people like it. I think one of the issues that has been observed here in Middlesex is that our ZBA often doesn't meet very regularly because there's so few things that come to them. and it kind of creates a little bit of lack of, I don't know if I want to say lack of professionalism, uh, but the board, the meetings don't run as smoothly just because they don't happen as frequently. But if you send all the zoning review elements to the DRB, they're likely going to meet more often and the meetings will tend to go smoothly because they've got a good sense of what they're trying to do. And I will kick it over to Theo. I think you both covered it well. I, I, for, for me, um, the idea of having some uh, perhaps a select for liaison or a rotating one and having perhaps in the appointed group one or two planning commissioners, I just want to reemphasize that, you know, and kind of the executive branch function, as it were, at the municipal level, we have some insight into the intent behind what we promulgate in our zoning bylaws and how they work. And so I, I think there's some advantage to have that expertise, even if that function is taken away, as it were, from the Planning Commission. Uh, so I just wanted to reemphasize that. I also do think, and I think this is really redundant, Sandy, you did a great job. There, there's there's a, an administrative streamlining that comes from this, that where it's, um, I mean, if you're going before the ZBA or going for 
conditional review. Uh, and if you're going to the planning commission, you're going for permitted review, but many of the criteria are truly the same. So we, we, we had a meeting where we essentially recited the same questions, not, not for protocol solely, but because it was our role to do it that way. Mm -hmm. And it, it just became somewhat absurd, really. Uh, so we think it could save time, money, perhaps focus expertise over time and uh, kind of be a win-win. I don't not appreciate, I'm going to say the word appreciate, but I mean to say, I don't fully understand the cons, uh, the, the, um, the, the pros seem strong enough for us to come here today before you. And, and we thank you for these opportunities to come and join you. So we'd love you to take this up and we could even do it with our current <laughs> zoning bylaw. Could we not as a matter of process, Madam Chair, or not? No, there, there is, I, I will just add, there is a specific process you need to yeah, go okay. through to do this. You have to have a hearing, you have to notice it, you have to invite the zoning board adjustment because you are effectively disbanding the zoning board of adjustment and you're, you're creating a new development review board. And it's only, it's an action that only the select board can do. It's not something that the planning commission or any other board or even the legislature can do. Legislature authorizes the select board to do it, but the select board would need to go through the process to- Right, I guess what I'm saying is if we punted on the timeline that we're currently talking about for our adoption and sending it to the voters, we could incorporate this kind of fundamental change in the next draft. Right, Where, yeah, if, 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 it would be helpful to know if this is, uh, something the select board would like to do because we could then incorporate it into the draft that we're working on in the zoning, which we hope to get completed in the next month or two. Can I just ask a question, Sadie, about the process? You said that you would eliminate an elected body, but which is if you're eliminating the ZBA, the ZBA is is an appointed body, right? You right. still have the elected planning commission members, right? Right. It eliminates an elected body from having any permitting responsibility. I see. Okay. Thank you. So for me, the biggest piece of this, and I read the, I read the material you sent along, Sandy, um, I, I had a hard time figuring out what the, <coughs> what the negatives were other than the fact that, you know, someone might make a case that having more eyes on it in certain cases could be a, could be a better thing. I like the idea, I very much like the idea of having people having one place to go to get their permit. I mean, sending them to two, I mean, it just sounds like, you know, bureaucratic tomfoolery. But I also think, I also think having some uh, uh, whatever we call it, cross membership, having having members of the planning commission, I mean, maybe even do it on a rotating basis, and and the same with the uh, and the same with the select board, but have them uh, participate so we don't so we don't lose that lose that knowledge. And I guess the other piece of it is, um, I presume. Unless I'm unless I'm wrong, that uh, someone could from the planning commission could could attend one of these meetings and participate in the meeting if they chose to. They wouldn't get to vote, I guess, but they could participate in the meeting, give advice, et cetera, et cetera. If there was you know, I, I I don't know because they if a hearing is is held as a hearing, I guess they could provide public comment. Um, you know, there's hearing procedures, but yeah, they could certainly provide them. You know, could you inv invite them to come in to consult? I don't know. I don't know what the right, the right words are, but I'm just, I'm just saying to, you know, if, if there's some hot issue where, where Theo is the expert, invite him to come and he can't vote, but he can talk about and explain what the issue is. Just saying. So Peter, uh, I think you hit on something with the rotating. I don't know if we discussed that, but that idea that might be less burdensome to both the select board and the planning commission and still have that insight and expertise uh, that I hadn't thought about that. That sounds, sounds inviting. Well, I, speaking for myself, I don't need, I don't think any of us need any more meetings to go to, but I, I do think, uh, I do think having other people involved is good. So we've, I, what I would what I would suggest for tonight is that uh, unless anybody disagrees, I think it's interesting to pursue this. And I guess I would I would challenge uh, challenge the planning commission to do a little more work on about exactly how we would organize this and how it would work and what would need to be incorporated in the zoning regulations. And then 
come back to us and by that time we can say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea or we have reservations, unless anybody has huge reservations tonight, in which case maybe we should wait, but I'm supportive of the idea. Me too. I'm, okay, I'm seeing nods from Phil yeah. and Liz and Steve. Yeah, good. Um, sure, well, the Planning Commission will we'll look into this further and I'll also talk with Sarah about what, what the process is. I will let folks know I did send um, an email out to the current members of the Zoning Board of Adjustment just so they would, you know, heads up that we, we would be talking about this with, with the select board. Um, there will need to be some, you know, formal hearing process if the select board chooses to go this route. Yep. I'm sorry, Randy, did you... I just didn't see you say one way or the other because we're all here together. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested in, in, you know, learning more about the process and and whatnot. And I've got to, you know, I've got to step back and think about it again. I'm new to the, to this whole world, so understanding how everything is connected is uh, probably takes me a bit more time than than some of these other folks. Thanks. I didn't mean to put you on a spot. That's really helpful. I don't so no, Randy. <laughs> So, so I, Madam I, Chair, I, we'll I come back with something. I have, right? I, have, I have heard uh, out there in the world that this does seem to work well in the communities that use it. So sounds like we have a sounds like we have a plan. Everyone all set on that? Thank you, uh, Sandy and Planning Commission members for attending. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the, the other matter is, is just um, we have a, a quarterly update. I don't need to take a lot of time. I did share ahead of time, um, you know, uh, a summary of our of our projects. I guess the two main matters that we're working on is the zoning update. We're pretty close to a final draft, probably in the next month or two. We will be sending out a survey um, to towns towns folks by email and putting a note on front porch form. <laughs> going to mail it to everybody but so share it with people just to get some feedback on a few issues including you know do towns folks think we should have a development review board um and if you if you're dying to know what we're looking at for zoning changes there's a, a, a red line draft that's on the what's next middlesex site it can be a little dense to go through happy to talk with anybody about it at any time but um it, it's there and I'll have a, a summary in the next month or two. And then the other piece is the um, walkable Middlesex scoping study that's winding down. Um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback and uh, we expect to have that, that report out in the next um, month or two as well. Um, it'll have a preferred design, which will include some streetscape improvements in and around Red Hen. Um, some sidewalks um, as part of the design, and then some partially barricaded bicycle lanes. Um, and our, the idea is that this is, you know, the overall preferred route. They all came in about the same cost to, you know, the alternatives that we looked at. They would all improve safety. This one seemed to address both um, comfort and safety for pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, better than some than you know other combinations, and I, you know the, this would be a project that um, we're envisioning would happen if at all when that that section of Route Two is upgraded, um, and it could be part of a of, of a bigger uh, V Trans project, not something that the town would take on on its own, but we would have the work done in advance of uh, in advance of V Trans up upgrading that road, which they're likely to do sometime in the next um, five years or so. Um, and I think those are those are the, the bigger highlights. And uh, oh, we have two new planning commission members. Um, I do know one of them, um, let me know she wasn't, she's out of town and was not able to join, but we're very excited to bring them on board and have them join the planning commission. Who are they, Sandy? Um, one is Nicole D'Agostino who lives on Shady Rill near Theo, and the other is John Liebowitz, who lives sort of at the bottom of East Hill near, near the Picards. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
reviewing and possibly approving a revised agreement outlining the town's access to the Rumling Memorial School action likely. And we have Chris McVeigh here with us tonight. Welcome, Chris. Hey, Peter. How's, how are you and everybody else? Hey, Chris. Hey, I think we're good. Hey, how are you? It was, a nice, it was a nice spring day today, so we're all in good spirits. It's great. Yeah. So, um, I've got your, got your document here. Uh, why don't you give, a, give us an overview of the changes and uh, let's see where it goes from there. Okay, so based on uh, my, when I was last here, um, I did make some changes uh, to the document to, to address your concerns. Um, I will say that I don't specifically remember what they were, um, but I um, also reached out to Elliot Berg and had him go through it because he's connected with the bandstand. And he had, he had two uh, good suggestions. One was to um, put in a timeline for if there was a dispute between, uh, if there was a, the, the school district raised a concern about access based on health reasons, uh, just put in a timeline when uh, that dispute needed to be uh, told to the applicant and, and resolved. Uh, so what I ended up doing was incorporating um, the timeline of that the applicant needed to be notified within a day of whether or not uh, health concerns had been raised and that the um, health folks had to get together and come to a decision within a week after the school district first raised any concern. Just to give it a, a framework so it didn't go on and on, and I, I thought that was very helpful um, on his part. So I guess the question is, I hope everybody had a chance to, uh, to read this over. The way, the way this, just, just, just help me out, the way this works is we agree to this and then the school district agrees to it, correct? Yes, we'd both have to agree to the procedure. I mean, right. but the, the fall, Peter, the fallback is, you know, the easement um, stands right. on its Otherwise, own. Right? You know, they're not agreeing, right? So, but the other thing is, this can be. I mean, if we start using this and there are problems with it, we can, we can, by mutual agreement, we can always amend it. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and and ultimately, the easement would control. So. so yes, I would. We've 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 bat batted this around for for quite a while. I guess my recommendation would be we approve this. We give it to the the school. Hopefully they approve it, and we're off to the races. And let's hope it works well. And if it doesn't, we'll uh, we'll have to change it or fall back on the easement or whatever we have to do. Yeah. Uh, but I see so, no reason not to go ahead and uh, and adopt this tonight unless someone has an objection or a concern. Wow, they're letting you off easy tonight, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it must be the weather. Well, I think it is. I think it is the weather, but I, I also think we've uh, we've pretty much beaten this thing to death. And I appreciate your uh, your patience and work on this. I know it hasn't been easy. Well, you know, I'm I'm glad I'm glad you brought it up. Um, and just because the deal was with the easement that there's access, and if they were saying no access, that's a problem. Yeah. Okay. So, so is is there a motion that the Middlesex Select Board will approve these procedures as as drafted by uh, Chris McVeigh? Can I make a recommendation? And with the amendments that I articulated tonight about the timeline for yes. the health officers. Yes. Okay. I'll motion, make that. Um, I'll move it. Okay, Liz. Thank you. Is there a second? Phil, thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of approving the uh, procedure for the town of Middlesex and its residents to have access to the Romney Memorial School, please say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We're good. So Great. thanks. You will, let us, you will let us know, Chris. I will let you know. And if the school approves this? Yes, I will let you know. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Have good nights. Yep. See you later. Okay. Bye. Good night. Okay, Victor. Town Highway Report. Good 
Yeah. <clears throat> um, we worked, uh, we've been pretty much over all the roads. Uh, we, we did the, the end over towards the town garage today and uh, Shane reported to me, I think around 4.30 that uh, they'd hit all those and the roads <clears throat> uh, on that side of town and they were headed for uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, fix up uh, or bring back uh, Center Road uh, uh, tomorrow and then uh, Brook Road and, uh, to uh, address it so that, uh, you know, get the, get the, uh, get the, uh, furrows back out and we are going to pick some of those up like you suggested and uh, some of the excess material but uh, probably have to wait for it to be a little drier to do that right my my comment to victor this week was it always breaks my heart every year when we when we grade the slushy slate off to the side and then we let let it dry out and then we grade it right back into the road again and then we we have the same issues over and over again. So I said, please, please, please go around with a bucket loader and scoop that stuff up. And if we can reuse it to fill holes on class four roads or however we can use it, that that's great. But let's not put it back on our main, uh, our main arteries. We push that stuff around enough. And I swear to God, every time we, every time we push it around, it gets more, more ground up and more slushy and more, uh, and more nasty. So and as I said, uh, <clears throat> they're looking for material up on uh, North Bear Swamp, the trail. They want to want to fix it up so they can walk walk Bear, North Bear Swamp. So that would be a good place. We'll pile it at uh, at the uh, town garage for first. Let it yeah. <clears throat> let it dry out. And when we get time, we can do it. And yeah. the, other thing, the other thing we spoke of, this will make you happy, is uh, the graders broke down. Get out of town. And uh, it, it was uh, at four o'clock, I was talking with Shane, and we were trying to determine whether to bring it back to the shop. The mechan the service guy was coming from uh, Burlington, um, but we wanted to make sure it was okay to move it. Uh, the, dr <clears throat> the drive shaft seal uh, out of the, uh, out of the, uh, transmission uh, was leaking so anyway the fun goes on and on hopefully that's a month hopefully that's a warranty repair i would hope is it yeah 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 so anyway, hopefully uh it won't require some parts that uh um um but they don't have or we can't get like like uh in other instances on our trucks and stuff where they where we were held up because we couldn't get uh, get parts, couldn't get it fixed. Yeah. Well, we've been, as you know, we've been hiring, uh, I guess we were on a bad connection, but we had, uh, uh, we've been hiring trucks. Uh, they say Newton on the side of them, but I think they're Barrett. Um, but Barrett's behind it. But Jeff uh, Newton is still uh, down there running the dispatch, and we've been <clears throat> we've been hiring them to haul for us. And uh, I believe you had uh, in your uh, in the bills there uh, the orders. Uh, you had some of the trucks for last week, but uh, we haven't gotten. Um, the bills for the material, most of it came out of uh, uh, Northeast, a little bit out of, uh, I don't think, I don't think Newton went to uh, up to Marshfield uh, uh, to get stuff. I think it all came out of uh, Northeast and Barrie. Do you have any, any rough idea, rough, 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 how much we spent? I saw the, the, the trucking bill on last week's order was what, 18,000, Dorinda? Something like that? 16, I think, or something. Yeah. Yeah. 16,950, I think. Yeah. 16, yeah, 16,950, exactly. Yeah. 
so we're probably we're probably in this now for what do you think 50 or 60,000 my guess would be 50 anyways yeah i mean that doesn't include the the, the town's uh the town forces but that's just you know yeah but the town for, we got the town forces anyway but correct correct but i just we can anticipate uh i think we all we all knew this was coming but we, we can anticipate that we're overspending our uh our highway budget once again and when we get to this meeting to talk about use of the arpa money there's there's a reason for uh for taking this approach i think potentially we can use some of this arpa money to make up some of that but we'll have to see when the we other good the other good news is that uh i talked to district six which is up at uh in Berlin there. <clears throat> and uh, actually one of the technician reached out to us a couple of weeks ago. There's a, there's a hope that we'll get some uh, stimulus money uh, through the agency of transportation or part of that, was it $1.8 billion that came to transportation that, that they're, that they'll reimburse us for uh, some of the uh, materials and time rented equipment and uh, things like that. We're keeping track of it and Good. because uh, uh, the tech, the uh, tech out of the agency of transportation uh, told us uh, that we should do that. And there's no guarantee we're going to get some, but hopefully we will. Yeah. Uh, I have one, I have one last question and other people may have questions. How are we doing on recruiting a new member for the road crew? Um, well, we haven't, we haven't interviewed anybody. We've been a little busy in the last couple <laughs> of years. Uh, um, I don't say that sarcastically. We just haven't, it just hasn't, we haven't had time. Yeah. We, we got, uh, uh, Matt Codling and, uh, I, I forget the other gentleman's name, uh, that, that had put in, uh, uh, Sarah can probably tell you what his name is. And uh, we had another guy, uh, Fuller, Mr. Fuller. Hey, that hey, Vic, 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 Vic. But, okay. I don't know if oh, these yeah. people are employed, but it's probably not a great idea to use their names at a public meeting that's being recorded until I don't right. want them to lose their jobs. All right. We've got two or three candidates. That's the bottom line. Right. That's the bottom line. We got a couple, yeah, two really. We got okay. a couple, uh, couple people that are looking at it, but they don't. They really not putting out their. Uh, they haven't put in a resume yet. I don't believe. Dorinda told me she was anxious to go to greater school. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's <Hey>, broken. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask Vic a question? Yes. Um, how how is the morale of the of the road crew? Are how are they doing during this time? And are are you getting like complaints from people? Like I, you know, how's that going in terms of the whole mud season? Can you do that over again? You kind of broke up. I'm just wondering how the morale of the road crew is during mud season. You know, are they getting complaints from people? Um, you know, are they feeling unappreciated? How's that going? No, I don't think they're feeling unappreciated. I think they get tired, I think, by the end of the week. I think when it comes into um, working Saturdays, they're not too crazy about that. And uh, yeah. Sundays, but most of the time, uh, we did stockpile the material so we could do that. Uh, that we would have it on the weekends, but that got is getting used up or is used up. We do replenish it during the week, but this last week we were pretty much uh, anything that we were bringing in, we were putting on the road. And, yeah. but no, um, oh yeah, you got some, um, there's some people that, uh, but they're far and few, but most people are pretty happy if you, you know, they're excited at first uh, uh, that, you know, 
they can't get through or their cars are bottoming out or, 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 you know, you know, the routine. And, uh, but if uh, most people, if you talk to them, uh, and tell them, you know, geez, you know, it's six o'clock at night and they've been working 12 hours and they're gone home. They probably can't do anything for you. They kind of understand. And, uh, yeah, we, uh, we, uh, no, I haven't. There's only about. There's only a couple of people that really, really, really uh, were, you know, kind of got off. But uh, it. Uh, I think most people are pretty happy. They got a lot of cookies and stuff over there, so somebody must be happy. <laughs> That's a good sign. Yeah. I will tell you, I I got uh, quite a bit of positive feedback. On the on the notices that you and Sarah have been putting out, talking about yep. what's going on with the roads, people really like that. Right. On the porch forum. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, to answer your question, I, I think I think the morale is good. It's Do you think we're going to have the capacity to, you know, be doing that really high tech mud mitigation that we did, you know, on like Molly Supel and. Some of the places that you know we have planned out that we have put off for the last couple of years because of other you know catastrophes um i just feel like you know this year of all years is you know the the time for us to to say like what is it that we're going to do about our roads are we going to you know really look at resurfacing them in a planned and coordinated way so that they're, you know, that they're in better shape, like some of these other towns that, you know, didn't or don't have the slate. I mean, it is like night and day. Now it's fine, you know, now the roads are totally passable, but, um, you know, I just, I feel like this is gonna keep happening. This, this is probably not an anomaly. Um, and I mean, it could be, but, you know, how, what are we thinking about in terms of, you know, really making significant changes to the roads? Well, we've just, I just to interrupt you for a minute, Victor. I, th I think that's something we, we as the select board in, in consultation with, with Vic and Shane need to be thinking about. I mean, if we're going to be, if we're going to be 50,000 in the hole on this year's budget because of this disaster, it's pretty hard to make the decision to go out and spend a spend a bunch of extra money but uh my understanding is and and help me out here dorinda if i'm wrong but by doing by taking the approach we're taking with this arpa money we have the potential to use some of that money to work on some of this stuff you know pick um, up. i don't know if it's if the road that type of thing would fall under it or not i mean I, I get we still have to adhere to um, certain standards. Um, we have more flexibility, but as long as it's a revenue loss thing, there's still different categories, you know, um, that you have to fall within. Yeah, no, I understand. But, it but sounded, I, you know, I, was, I was trying to read it in and read it in an optimistic way. And it sounded to me like we potentially could use some of the money, but maybe I'm wrong. But I think it's worth exploring the, you know, Biden's, um, infra you know, his bridges and roads infrastructure money. I believe that money, Linda, uh, Lindsey Curley may have mentioned it somewhere that that money can be used toward our dirt roads and that we need to prioritize which dirt roads. And I, I just feel like that needs to be a priority goal of the select board, um, that we do this year because those funds, you know, may have time constraints on them. I'm not sure. Um, but I mean, I, I would worry less about the town having to foot that bill and more about how do we access the money to get that work done. Yeah, I think I couldn't, there's agree, I couldn't agree with you more, Liz. And, and certainly to say that the uh, interest by our community to get some of this work done is high. They're they're going to be motivated to uh, support doing this. In perspective, uh, Liz, uh, it's a big undertaking. It's uh, Peter no. since fifty thousand. Uh, 
a foot of material, um, which we don't put a foot of material in our jobs. We don't, we don't, uh, even when we resurface some of the ones we've done in the last, last four or five years, we, we don't put that amount. But a foot of the material that uh, if you want to use granite uh, for a mile is about $70,000. Oh, I know. I mean, that, and that, doesn't include, that, do, that doesn't include getting it to getting it here or removing the other stuff, whatever you want to do. Uh, the problem, in my mind, uh, in my opinion, is they were trying to build roads from uh, the uh, top down and uh, that doesn't work well. Right. And, um, well, that's the thing that's the most discouraging to me about all this money we just sent. If, if, if my past memory is correct, all that granite or a hell of a lot of it that we put down is just going to disappear into the quagmire over the next year or two. It seems to do that. And, uh, but, I mean, that's an awful big undertaking. Uh, uh, I know. To, uh, to uh, and, 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 and let's face it, your, your road crew is... Uh, where we, we intended to do that section of center road and repaving. I mean, that's, uh, you know, we thought that uh, we would get that all around so that uh, at one point we were going to start it in May, but I mean, obviously we can't because, uh, you know, we're, we're doing other stuff. I, uh, we have mentioned that we've got until 23 to do it so we can put it off. We're not in dire straits here, but it's just a lot of work and, and uh, for uh, for us all to keep up with, um, and I think that twenty grand that we had for uh, you know uh, services from other people, I think we pretty much used that up already. Yeah, we definitely have. Oh. That's the good news. We had it there. But the good news, as Peter says, is that we've been we're talking about it, Blitz, and we're thinking about it, and uh, and uh, and trying to trying to get a plan together uh, to, uh, you know, uh, I don't think you're ever going to say, I think this year was a unique year. Uh, and I think it, uh, you know, people think that Middlesex is in bad shape, but it's all over the state of Vermont that, uh, I mean, I don't know if we had any roads closed. I mean, it might've been closed because people just didn't want to get through or thought they couldn't or whatever. But a lot of towns still got roads closed. Right. Yeah, I mean, we're not the only town, obviously. And and I think, you know, that that there is hopefully the league or something will have or, you know, someone can guide us on this because it's not something we can do alone. And we're not the only town who's going to be wanting funding to help repair these right. things because it was, you know, it was bad and it was you know, dangerous. Um, and, you know, it's not, I'm not putting blame on anyone. I think it's just more about making sure that we are identifying any kind of funding sources, because we know this is not something we are, we as a town can pay for. Um, and it's probably something that's going to have to be contracted out and good luck finding people. Right. I mean, it's a, it's not going to happen next year. Um, or this year. So it's just, I just don't want us to be like, oh, well, this is just part of nature, right. you know, if there are oh. resources out there. But I don't think there's any doubt in the future that uh, this is going to happen again and continue to happen because we have, uh, we have winters that don't have much snow. And uh, we have like this winter was very, very cold. I mean, we got snow, but it all, you know, then, 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 then the sun would come out and melt it all down and like spring is here. And then all of a sudden we'd get, you know, 10 inches a foot or so. And all that did was, uh, you know, drive the frost down. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've got a lot, a lot to think about, but I agree with you, Liz. I mean, if there's, if there's money out there, we need to aggressively go after it and not wait for somebody to call us up and give it to us. So let's keep our ears to the ground. I know, I know you will, Victor and Shane will, and, and uh, we will as we will as well, as we hear about these, uh, as we hear about these opportunities. I mean, uh, you know, 
we've talked it over and the, the, the roads, well, I don't want to scare you, but uh, we would have to put a lot more money into gravel. I mean, some of these towns that, you know, they, that they, that they, that they uh, maybe didn't see it as bad as we did, or, you know, didn't have as much problem with uh, gravel, uh, but they're spending a lot more money per year than we are. Uh, right. Uh, so it's uh, as many parts to it. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, getting, getting a, a crew or getting the people to do it. Um, also, we've, uh, you know, these, <clears throat> these, these places that uh, we're getting material from, uh, you know, of course, we're not the only town there in, uh, some of the material is, uh, you know, we've used up a lot of stuff that they've had stockpiled. So in the future, we might be in a situation where we coordinate with people to, uh, you know, to have material on hand that, that we can get, uh, get you know, to uh, talk to the suppliers and, and uh, you know, kind of coordinate what, what, what our needs are. The other thing I think that, that, that would make sense and we've done it in the past and maybe we need to get back to it is it just i followed one of those big one of those big uh 10 wheel trucks loaded up with stone down through the mud i mean that may be the solution but in the short run running those trucks up and down, down the roads makes it a lot worse so we could haul stone in in the uh in the in the summertime and have it stockpiled around town so we didn't have to run around all over town with big 10 wheel trucks, that might be a good thing as well. That's an excellent idea that we could, you know, and uh, I've offered to, if it would help to put material over here. I mean, I don't care uh, over here on the, my property. And uh, they did. Uh, but Shane has been doing an excellent job uh, of whenever we get uh, a free minute and actually have three trucks running all at one time. We uh, we do go get material. We did. We had we have quite we had quite a bunch of it stockpiled. Yeah, and, yeah. And I think uh, you got to give uh, Shane credit for for looking ahead and, and doing that. But I'm just I'm you know I mean we don't have don't. places, but they're definitely places places around town owned by the town places owned by by citizens who would allow us to, to stockpile some stuff just so we're not running up and down the roads with those heavy trucks quite as much as we were this year. Right, right. Okay. Good Did idea. You, anything else for Victor? Yeah, I just, I had a couple things that I was thinking about. It's just, um, you know, there's been discussion about possible reimbursement for some of this mud mitigation work that's going on and whatnot. And we probably have some system in place to, to track this when we have it. And um, I mean, how are we, how are we tracking? Are we, are we tracking, you know, by, by, you know, flagging stuff? Um, is it done at the town town hall? Just curious as to, you know, if, if something comes back to us and says, yep, we've got X amount of dollars. Now you just have to show us what all those cars are, how uh, costs are. How are we tracking that, like labor, materials, all all that kind of stuff? We're, well, 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 Shane is keeping track of that as far as uh, you know your your uh, hired hired uh, uh, trucks. Your hired uh, we we hired some uh, somebody to uh, actually do some leveling over on East Hill for us. Uh, we keep track of that man hours and uh, and that cost and the cost of the material. Uh, and, uh, basically, uh, what, uh, what the state told us to keep track of Shane is, uh, Shane's got a log of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that popped into my head was just as we were, I was, I was, I was listening about the grader. Um, you know, we, we definitely see a bunch of, a bunch of repair fees and parts and all that kind of stuff and, and whatnot. And, uh, keeping a, a log of like, you know, what's happening with each of these trucks and stuff like that. I know sometimes we've had conversations about, Oh, well, it might've been this truck or it might've been that truck that broke down or whatever. And seeing how here's a, the greater, the first, first time it's, it's broken down. Um, I don't think it'd be a bad idea to just 
start right from scratch and, and keeping a log of, of it. So you could look back at what the graders reliability has been when we, when we ever get to that point or, you know, if the same parts keep breaking or whatnot. So I don't know if that's something that changes. uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure about this, but I will, I will check with uh, Shane, but I know in the past and I hope it's still going on. Our practice was when they sent invoices down to uh, the office to be paid, that they kept a copy of those invoices in files for each one of those trucks. So as much as we might get confused about which truck it is, I think we've got good records, or I believe we do. And if we don't, we will start doing it again of just keeping track of what goes into each vehicle and what all the invoices are. Each, yeah. you know, do you know, Vic, if they're still doing that down at the down at the down garage? Yeah, they have a they have a tab on uh, or a, a file on each vehicle, but uh, also I believe uh, part of that. Uh, as far as the grader goes, the dealer the dealer keeps uh, has a has a uh, service record of everything that's done to that, and they have as a service. Uh, there's a service plan that comes with that grader. I forget how many years. It, it, I, I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I have to ask Shane. I think it was seven years, if I remember right, when we were going through that. Right. That's what I remember. Yeah. But the, I but remember the, point, the seven the years. The is well take. taken to be, able to, to be able to look and say, because, you know, we're always saying, well, you know, should we run these trucks for five years? Should we run them for seven years? And I know in the past we would pull out all those invoices and say, well, here at year five is where we really – I mean, I think of our old one tons. After four or five years, we'd be pouring in the money. We practically rebuilt them from one end to the other. So, you know, keeping track of that and trying to figure out what we can do better or if there's a problem with a particular operator or, you know, who knows what the, what the issue is. But you're right. I mean, I, every time I look at those orders, I think, oh, my God, more, more and more repairs. It never ends. And yeah, yeah. And again, some of these questions that I ask may be just happening and I don't know. I'm new. So just trying to continue to learn the process and make suggestions where I see, you know, uh, or at least a perceived um, understanding that something's not going on. So. Oh, that's great. We, you're, we're calling you the new eyes, Randy. New eyes. Yes, Dorinda. I just want to back up on something in regards to keeping track of this mud mitigation that um, if there's a grant or something that comes out like it has, you know, in the past, we they awarded this money for like storms and all that it also comes down to keeping track of the number of hours worked on a particular piece of equipment and Um, how many hours were put in towards that. So I don't know if that part's being captured or not, but I'm sure Steve can weigh in on, you know, we did a storm from 2019 and it took quite a bit of work to go back through the invoices after the fact and try to create what payroll at related to what piece of equipment, which related to all of that. Um, so, I mean, the other way of doing it is if anything's relating to a storm is we could create a separate chart of account number that is called just mud mitigation 2022 and all the expenses relating to that could go into that if need be. But I I just wanted to throw it out there that, you know, it goes beyond just whether or not, you know, the physical bills we're incurring it also relates to hours on equipment and all of that yeah Yeah. well we'll we'll have to go over over that with shane and make sure we're uh we're on the right page and that we are yeah because we don't we don't typically track uh, what the guys are doing every day. Like, you know, there've been times in the past when we had storms where two of the guys would be working on storm repairs and two would be working on regular 
yeah. grading or maintenance or ditching or, or whatever. So maybe we need to invent some way so we can code it separately so we can keep track of it so it isn't such a nightmare after the fact. Yeah. It should, shouldn't be hard for it, us to catch up in the last two or three weeks because I think they all been working on one thing. <laughs> they, they do put on their timesheet whether it was mud mitigation or whatever. So that's how you do it. But when you're trying to, you know, it's just easier to do it as we go along than trying to go back and pull out invoices and payroll sheets from months past is all I'm saying. Yeah. Not fun, was it? Was it? No, it wasn't. And it then, wasn't. you know, <laughs> no, Steve can tell you it was not fun. It took a lot of man hours to put it all back together. And, you know, then it came down to each piece of equipment had a rating for hours that it was used. And, you know, there was a lot to it. Well, what I would, what I would suggest is now that we have an up to speed professional bookkeeper, you know, if you have some thoughts about how we could code things better, whether we establish a separate chart of accounts or whatever we do and get ready. So when we start start our fiscal year in July, we can have a clean date and say, OK, as of this date, we're we're doing it this way. I mean, I, I, I agree. I think to go back and recapture what we did for the last few weeks would be relatively easy because it basically right. be 100 percent of everything. But yeah. a lot of the times it isn't so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Anything, Thank anything you. else? Anyone? I mean, the good, the good news is just in the last few days, the, the roads are a lot better. Boy, they were, they were bad last weekend. I can tell you, he still was as bad as it's ever been last weekend. But anyway, we got a lot of, a lot of stone out there now. Um, discussing a proposed cell tower on Worcester side of Norton Road action possible. So what happened was, and I'm sorry, I don't have the, maybe I do. The gentleman's, the gentleman's name, I printed out the letter. I thought I did. No, well, I can't find it now. I, I printed out um, the letter that he sent. You all, you all received a copy of it. And right. he basically, he called me up and he said, he said two things. A, we're having a hell of a time with this cell tower issue in Worcester, and we can use any any kind of support, of, you know, even just even just a letter, just just to help us out would be very much appreciated. But the other thing he said, which was very concerning to me, and I haven't had a chance, I haven't had a chance to get back to him, but we certainly need to do it. He said. You know, we thought we had zoning in place. We we'd taken all the steps that the League of Cities and Towns recommended. So we would have whatever possible influence we could have on the siting of these cell towers. And it all turned out to be worthless. This company came in and just said, we bought this land and we're putting up this cell tower and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. And your zoning regulations don't apply. So that that scared me a little bit because, I mean, I thought we have, you know, we have language in our zoning regulations. We've We've done, to the best of my knowledge, all the stuff that we're supposed to do to have as much control over this potential issue as possible. And if it's really true that that's all for naught, then, you know, whether the League of Cities and Towns needs to get after the legislature or we need to figure something out. But certainly in the short run, uh, to send out a letter of support to support our neighboring town, I don't think it's a bad idea. He he sent us an example of a, of a draft letter we could have... Uh, have, have Sarah do her usual usual good work and create that letter and send it out if you all agree. Yeah. Yes, Barbara. Um, yeah, so I'm not quite sure I understand. I thought that uh, we were going to erect a new cell tower in Middlesex, is that correct or not? Oh, this is, this is the cell tower that's proposed in Worcester. Okay. Okay. But it is um, out, it is out on the end of Norton Road, so it's you know it's fairly close. It's fairly close to Middlesex, but it's it's definitely in Worcester, and it's very close to a couple of houses. And he said the other thing he said is we tried to work with them. We came up with four or five sites which we thought were much better sites, and in fact they were on their list as potential sites, and they wouldn't even look at them. They said this is this is the best site for us. 
this is where we get the best coverage and we don't care if we're right next to somebody's house. Okay. Okay. So I that, see. Th that's what the process is. And this, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what he told me in a conference, in a telephone conversation. And he did, he did send over that, uh, that, that letter, but I'll, I'll tell you, it scared me because I, I thought we had at least some control over that issue in Middlesex. And if he's correct, we don't. Well, well, as far as I understand it, and I, I don't know a lot about the situation, but that the 1996 Telecommunications Act put every put the onus on um, municipalities so that there should be something we can do. I mean, there, there I, I, and again, I, I don't have any law background either, but um, you know, there are cities and towns, states around the world that have um, initiated moratoriums on the advancement of the cell tower technology because there are, there are zero um, safety studies that show they are safe for, for human biology and animal insects. Um, and there are hundreds, if not thousands of peer reviewed scientific studies that do show harm to humans, animals, bees, navigation ability, you know, uh, to find their way back to the hive even. And all of those, most of those studies are, are based on, you know, 3G and 4G technologies. So I think it's definitely something that if we can get out ahead of it, if it's not too late, that we should. And I don't well, really have an yeah, answer. We're, we're at, for instance, we're, we're right in the throes of, of rewriting our zoning regulations, revising our zoning okay. regulations right now. So... <laughs> if there's some new language or some new material that we have to have in there to protect ourselves, we should we should get it in there. But I, as I a, need as Barbara. A, I need Barbara's last name. Oh, oh I'm sorry. sorry. I'm Barbara Thomas, okay. and I live on East Hill Road. And I I would love to thank Vic and his crew because <laughs> they've made a huge difference on our road. Um, and and um, Peter, I'm happy to look into um you know, some, you well, know, how, how to go about that. Well, I, that would be great. And uh, Sandy's got her hand up too. Sandy? Yeah, since I saw that Barbara lives on East Hill Road, there is a proposal pending to expand the cell tower that's up on top of East Hill. That's there now. And they came in, I think they have a, a proceeding that's before the Public Utilities Commission they met with the planning commission to talk about what they were going to do there. And, and we have the drawings and increase it. We put out a notice about it. We didn't, and they sent a notice to all the neighbors in the area. We didn't hear, I mean, the planning commission didn't hear concerns about that. So uh, if folks are concerned, it's kind of out of our hands at this point, the planning commission would have had the opportunity or the town would have had the opportunity to participate in the public utility commission proceeding. Um, but that's a- I so that I just so there there is a proposal as I understand it that's going through the process for expanding the tower in Middlesex. Kevin may know more. Thank you. Yep, Kevin. Yeah, um, I I have heard from several different parties involved with that, and and it's uh, it's an extension. From my understanding it's, it's it's an extension of twelve feet of that current tower. Um, I have not seen a permit application for it. Um, I know that they have done some stuff with the state, but according to our, according to our zoning, uh, zoning regs is that they are supposed to have a conditional use permit for that extension. Um, I also want to point out one of the differences between us and Worcester is that we actually have zoning. Worcester does not. Correct. Um, but Worcester does have uh, an ordinance about cell towers and, and heights and all of that. Um, so I think we're probably in a much stronger position because, because we do have zoning. Yeah. That's well, my, my, my suggestion is, I mean, what, what this was, was just a red flag for me. And I, I was aware, I don't know where I heard it, but I was, I was aware. And I've, I've been back in the old days when that was the WNCS FM tower, I used to 
hike up there on snowshoes with Jeb Spalding to replace parts on his transmitter. So I'm very familiar with that site. If there's ever a good place to have a cell tower, that's probably a good place. And it isn't, it isn't that tall. And it's, most people don't even know it's there. So the good news is I don't think 12 feet is going to make a big, uh, a big difference there. But I mean, you know, if all of a sudden somebody wanted to put up with a cell, a cell tower across the street from me and my neighbor had sold them the land and they were doing it and I had no control over it and the town had no control over it, I'd be upset. So anyway, all, all I'm suggesting is I don't think it hurts to support Worcester and, and send out a, a revised version of that letter. I'm happy to I'm happy to stop by and sign it. But at the same time, uh, I do think we need to uh Sandy, if you can, if you can take a look at this and see if there's anything more should we be doing, Barbara, uh, you can do it. We can also reach out to the to the League of Cities and Towns. I mean, they're obviously dealing with this. One of the one of the problems is that there's a big push on from the Scott administration to put up a whole. I forget what the number is, but a large number, a large number of towers, and uh, we've certainly got uh, parts of Middlesex that have no cell service at all. One of the one of the issues with this tower in Worcester that does have the potential to light up a lot of the other side of Middlesex. So, you know, the positive side of it is we might get cell service over on the other side of Molly Supel Hill, but that doesn't mean they should put it up within 300 feet of somebody's house. Yeah. Or, or a school, you know, or a school, yeah. 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 And I, I think governor Scott's looking to uh, put up 100 towers throughout vermont right wow. so that's a lot of towers there's going to be a there's going to be a lot of action if that really is going to happen and and of course the other thing is the other thing is that uh yes it's good to have cell service when you're driving around in your car but if what people really want is to have cell service at their houses if we're going to have fiber optic cable running all over vermont we're going to be doing wi-fi calling anyway so what do you need a cell tower for? But that's a whole other uh, that's a whole other issue. Well, the other thing is we can we can shut we can choose to shut off our phone or our Wi-Fi router at night, but we cannot choose to we can't opt out of having the radio frequency pollution that's coming off those towers coming right into our bodies. I don't know. It's on. When they're on, they're on. I mean, that's that's the only other thing that I like about. Uh, like about that East Hill Tower is it's pretty remote. There aren't really any houses that, that close to it. So that that makes that a fairly desirable site for me. But one of the things we've done is I think, Sandy, isn't it isn't it above 2,000? What, what's the height limit where we can, can't have cell towers? Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, but it's along the Worcester Range above, I think, 1,400 feet or 1,500 feet, and then yeah. the top of Dumpling Hill maybe above 1400 feet. And those are specifically identified as telecommunication, telecommunication tower exclusion areas. So they can't go there. Um, you know, I think there is some process by which, you know, tower developers can try and trump that and mm -hmm. the public utility commission that's complicated. I do know the town doesn't have any say over health and safety. You can do as much as you want to say you don't want it because it's unhealthy and too bad. That's not a land use issue. Sorry, um, you know that falls on some. You know somebody else is doing that. So well, the irony, the irony of all this is, and I understand people don't want to be looking at at uh, cell towers or windmills, but I'd rather look at a cell tower than a windmill. And the perfect place to put a cell tower, as any radio person would tell you, is up in a fairly high site because you're going to get the best signal and be able to see it. So. You know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. If you don't want to look on a, on a mountainside, you're going to have people trying to put them up down in villages and there aren't enough silos and church steeples to put them up on. Anyway, does, does, is there a general agreement that we can, we can send out that letter to Worcester? Does anybody have any reservations about that? I, I just have a question that Sandy might be able to answer. Um, I, I don't know if you saw the letter that was uh, sent, Sandy, but he specifically uh, cites this uh, 240A process. Um, the zoning, zoning ordinances uh, are preempted by this 240A. Um, is that what you were just talking about as being kind of a, a, 
a shot in the dark to, to bypass the, the zoning ordinances that we have and the public utility commission can, can just overrule that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are sort of, I mean, broadly speaking, these are considered sort of statewide issues and no, t no one town should be able to say, no, you can't put them here. So the, t so the state has the ability to, to say, we don't really have to pay attention to what the town says, but they, they can't just do that without reason. What they're looking to as the town enforce this, has, does the town otherwise restrict development in those areas? Or is the town just saying, no, we don't wanna look at a tower here. And that's my very kind of off the cuff from some experience in dealing with these issues. Uh, <coughs> way more to it than that. But yes, the state and Phil's nodding his head, he probably has dealt with this as well. But sure. the state can trump what the town wants, but that doesn't mean the town doesn't have any say. The town can still say, we have zoning in place, we have this, we otherwise restrict development here, please follow what our town has said. Thank can I you. ask a question? This is sort of what Randy was just asking and what um, Kevin just said. Um, that Worcester, so in or, when you say zoning ordinance, zoning regulations, is that the same thing, first of all? Yeah, zoning okay. ordinance and zoning regulation are the same. Okay, so, um, and this fellow in this email, um, the, you're saying, Kevin, they didn't even have, they don't even have zoning regulations in Worcester. What, what do they have? Nothing? They have, I think they have a town plan. And they have some other policy related to okay. cell towers. And the Public Utilities Commission needs to look to the town plan and needs to interpret the town plan when they go through their process. But it's, you know, this state body that's interpreting it. It's not the town that's interpreting it. Okay. Thanks. Um, I just oh, want to, I just oh. want to encourage you to do the letter as someone who's probably going to be looking at this tower from my place. Um, this thing as proposed is is going to be almost 200 feet above the tree line. Uh, and it's and it's not very far over over the uh, town line from the Middlesex line. Uh, so us in Putnamville are going to be seeing this tower and and I think it's it's just so far beyond the scale of what's of what's needed. So thanks thanks for doing that. Yeah, I mean it. You know, I I talked to him on the phone for about a, for about an hour, and like like I said, it it what he was saying scared me, and it some of it went over uh, went over my head. But they've been work they've been working hard on this, and they're they're scared to death that this thing is going to go forward. So. Um, Again, our, our select board members, are we are we okay to send out that letter? Have Sarah, have Sarah draft it and send it out? I don't think we need yes. a motion. Okay, so you Sarah, you need a motion for that. If you'd can like, just, it, we can do one. Well, can I just get your outline on why you uh, what your objections are to, to put in the letter? If Sandy says uh, maybe. Sandy, since you know about this, what would be the most things that would work with the state if like health and stuff doesn't work? Which of the board, you guys need to agree why you're, why you're opposed to this? I thought, I thought you had a draft letter that they were looking for. Yeah, so they, yeah. they have one on the bottom of his email here. And it basically, oh, okay. it basically yeah. just outlines the, the fact that they want select boards and planning commissions to be involved in siting process before locations are determined um town ordinances and zoning and town plans must be followed in the process of siting and structure design for telecommunication towers and number three public good not developers profit must remain paramount and town governance must guide this process and you want to keep it at that you guys don't want to add anything to the letter i thought it was i thought it was pretty good okay i, mean, I would if you want you see something that you want to Nope. Your, your special nope. I didn't know if there was anything. I mean, when Kevin said, you know, it's uh, it's overkill. But I thought that was interesting. Um, but if you just want to, I'm just. It's, this is your chance to customize. I've, unfortunately, I feel like I don't know enough about this to customize it. But All right, I want to support them. Unless okay. anybody has anything else that we should add. Okay. I'm sorry. Did you say that we all should sign it, not just Peter? 
Is this going to be you along with the orders and stuff? Or not? Oh, I, I can't turn that around that fast. I don't know. Maybe I can. I, um, I think I can sign it as chair. Okay, I it's I fine. Sign it as chair yeah. on, okay. behalf the, on behalf of the board, Liz. Okay. Okay. Minutes of the March 15th, 2022 Select Board meeting. Motion. Move approval. Okay, thanks, Phil. Second. Second. Steve, Randy. You pick, sir. <laughs> How about it, Steve? <laughs> uh, okay, all, all in favor of approving the minutes of the March 15th select board meeting, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Uh, we have... Wait, hold on. Steve didn't second that, right? You didn't second that, right, Steve? Right. Yes. Oh. You did? He you did second there. it. He's, you he's Steve and Randy. They both raised their hands simultaneously. Oh, but Steve wasn't there. Randy. But Steve wasn't there. Right. Right. Oh. Oh yeah, there's a problem. <laughs> uh -oh. He was busy vacationing. That's right. Randy, it's it's in your court. I believe it was cocktails on the beach, wasn't it, Steve? <laughs> I think you're right. An important <laughs> priority. Um okay. Well we've we've uh we've proved our minutes orders. Uh they were down there today to sign. Steve signed them. I signed them. So we need we need more order signers. I'm uh, here tonight. I can sign. Okay, that'd be great. And, but don't forget the resolution. You can't just not come back to do. It's the already resolution. in the yellow folder. I'll be back. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> I'll stop in tomorrow. Thank you, Steve. It's and Randy, like you can sign it tonight. <laughs> it's just like Ghostbusters. I'll be back. <laughs> Considering a curb cut for Steve and Marissa Mel Melamed. Melamed. Melamed at the property they own on North Bear Swamp Road, action likely. Do we have a diagram? Do we know where this is? It is exactly 1.1 miles from Nellie Chase Road. And uh, Shane has already approved it. Oh, good. They bought, they brought property from Sue Bettman. Yep. Oh, cool. Okay. So don't do, do we normally vote on these curb cuts or do we just you just you just bring it to the select board meeting and the select board signature the the, the habit has been for uh, the the chair to sign or the board to allow the chair to sign because it says on the form select board signature but there's only one space. Okay, yep. but we do want a motion, right? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So let's have a motion to approve the curb cut unless there's some objection. I'll make that motion. Okay, right. Second. Thank okay. I'll second yeah, it. Thank you. Okay, all in favor of approving the curve cut for Steve and Marissa, Marissa Melamed, North Bear Swamp, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, correspondence, Sarah? No. I'm, I always send you everything I get. Okay, perfect. Dorinda. What about the, oh, yeah. Your friend is on. Okay. Um, I'm about to bill out for Welch Park to Benderson and um, and uh, Carl Balin. And I was wondering if I could add a um, service charge for the accounting department's time. <laughs> I wondered what your thoughts were. That might get some attention. <laughs> <laughs> yes do it i don't know it's fine i, I just you. wanted your blessing before i did it but and i you say know, I, I don't know within, if I, I say it's within the scope of your authority Me okay too. well <laughs> not really but you uh, know i just think we're the bank for most of this and you know why not bill them for it so i don't know what do you think 20 bucks each or something like that sure stick it in there can't hurt Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, believe it or not, we have some action on Welch Park, Park which I need to, uh, I need to report on. Um, I did contact Rob Halpert and I stirred him up after our last meeting, and he has been diligently poring over all the, all the documents and trying to understand the history and everything else, and also consulting with, uh, consulting with John Riley. 
and his tentative, I mean, he's, he's in the midst of it. He's not to the, to the finish line yet, but uh, I told him we were having a meeting tonight and I wanted to be able to report because I was afraid Dorinda was going to slap me on the wrist again if I didn't have something to report. So here's the report. He has two ideas of how potentially we can handle this other than continue the way we are and try and have somebody else handle it, like hand all, all over to Benderson and let them handle it, which I don't think we want to do for all kinds of reasons. He said, number one, he thinks it's relatively simple for the town of Middlesex because we do not use any of the shared utilities other than the road to petition to withdraw from Welch Park. And he said, the way to do that would be to formally notify the other parties that the town of Middlesex wishes to withdraw effective July 1st, 2022 or whatever it is. And then, then let the games, let the games begin. He said, you know, the, the carrot you have to offer, which we've talked about in the past is that in exchange for that, uh, we would take over responsibility for the road. But I said to him, I said, I'm, I'm reluctant to throw that in the beginning. I'd rather, save that for the carrot at the end to make the deal. And he agreed with that concept, but we, we could do whatever, the, whatever the sense of the, whatever the sense of the board is. Um, the more complicated thing to do, which I think is what uh, Bernie Balin now wants to do, and which isn't that bad an idea, is to do away with the whole thing. And he said, the problem with that is we're gonna have Act 250 permits and you know, those some of those other permits that we've been dealing with there that we have to we have to deal with because somebody's going to have to take take responsibility for them and I don't know how and he didn't know how without doing some more work that you know if there's no more park why is there even an Act 250 permit but in, to some level there has to be an ongoing Act 250 permit I guess but anyway um, you know t to me to me. I don't really care. I know, I know Bernie needs to have access to the septic and he's going to want to have access to the septic. But Rob said uh, he could, he could get an easement for access to that septic. And we all have the right to use the fire pond. They can't, they can't not allow us to use the fire pond. We've been told that over and over again. Now we can't use the fire pump, but that isn't connected to any of our stuff anyway. It's only connected to the, to the, uh, Benderson, uh, Benderson building. So he's got a, he's got a little more work to do before he comes to us with a formal recommendation. And I guess what I would like to suggest is that we somewhere along here, like not, not the 19th, cause we've already reserved that, but maybe the next meeting we have him come to the meeting and, uh, lay this, lay this out for us better than I'm laying it out now. I will, I will forward to all of you the, uh, the emails that he sent me in the last two days, so you can read them over because a lot of this is in those, uh, in those emails. But he was not saying in any way, manner, shape that it was impossible to do this, and you know maybe not even that unwieldy, especially if it's just us withdrawing. Do we lose any benefit to? withdrawing or having this thing dissolve? I mean, what do we, what does the town actually get out of this arrangement? So we have, we have the right to uh, water rights to a well there, but we don't use that well. We have our own well. And probably if we needed another well, it would be cheaper for us to drill another well on our, on lot four down there where the fire department is than to, uh, than to uh, participate in this joint well. And we've had to pay for some maintenance uh, on that well over, over time, Randy. The other thing we yeah. have is the right to, uh, there, are, there are backup areas that are, that are designated for backup septic, but they're way up the hillside from where the fire department is. So why in the world I mean, there's almost no septic load at the fire department anyway, but if that septic system ever failed, we have plenty of land down there and it would be way more cost effective to do whatever we had to do down there rather than pump sewage all the way up the hill to some auxiliary shared 
leach field. So Absolutely. The, is, the, the really the only thing we use is the, is the road and we need the road. I mean, we put the fire department there. That was one of the issues we knew we were going to have when we put the fire department there is we need the road. Just a quick question. Was there, is there ever real estate there for, I don't know, rent or something for the town clerk? Did we ever look into the town clerk's office being in Welch Park? Not that I know of, no. I mean, there's certain, there's land down there. I mean, it could be down there. I mean, I'm just thinking like, you know, what if? We're not <laughs> what if we needed a space for the town clerk's office and we've given we're not, up this? We're not giving up, we're not giving up any of the land we own. No, we're I know. No, but, I know. And, and, you know, you couldn't, they wouldn't let you build a town clerk's office where the auxiliary septic field is. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so I so my quick answer is I I think whatever benefit there would be potentially there, we're going to retain that benefit because we're still going to own the land. I mean, could you? I I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound like we really lose much by either by any of this, you know. So it seems like a no brainer. Get it, get the hassle off from our plate, and and just be done it, with it. And, and I, I think I agree with you, Peter, you know, holding on to, you know, whatever we have for a carrot until the end of the deal to, to sweeten the pot if we ever needed to. I, I, I definitely don't think we should be throwing that right up out in the front. No, no. Although, you know, the reality is <laughs> we're going to have to maintain that road anyway because we're the last ones in the line. So but it, but anyway, the other the other thing that I would I would try and negotiate if it comes down to it is the upper part of that, and I went down and looked at it again, so I was sure my memory was right, but the upper part across from, uh, across from, I still call it the telephone building, but Benderson's building is all paved. <coughs> so, you know, ideally I would like the town not to be responsible for paving that, that we would maintain it as a, as a, uh, as a gravel road, not as a paved road, but that's, that's down the road. But anyway, more more news to come. But at least that's some, uh, that's some real uh, that's some real progress. And I will send out to everybody. Uh, I'll, I'll forward those emails around tomorrow. Okay. Anything I have else? One last, oh. I have I have one more. Okay. <laughs> this is not something I'm fond on bringing up again, but I feel I'm obligated to bring it up. Did you guys get my email from this afternoon? I did. You did. Okay. So I, I don't understand exactly. Exact. I mean, are you saying that those boots that he purchased don't meet that standard? Well, first of all, two pairs were purchased instead of one. All right. There, there was two, two pairs of boots on the same <laughs> purchase order. Secondly, it does not meet, according to our policy, our boots are supposed to have eight inch ankle support. Neither one of these boots are eight inches. And lastly, the ASTM number is different than what it says it's supposed to be. I don't know anything. I know that's a rating for, I think, a steel toad. And these are composite toad. I don't know if that's the difference in the rating, but it's not the same rating. I just, you know, I, I, I think we beat this boot thing to death and I'm surprised it came just don't see, we don't ever, We don't ever seem to get to the end of it. I, I agree. I mean. I... Well, can I just say one of the problems I had with the purchase was that he approved it. Like, I don't think that should ever happen that he approves his own purchases. Like Vic should approve them. I mean, that's just sort of common spending sense in any business that you don't like, so no one could even, no one was able to even like, look at that to say, oh, you know, Shane, it's, you're, you're choosing the wrong boot. I, I, I don't know anything about boots, but like, to me that there needs to be something around spending for yourself and approving it. But I agree. I, well, I, think, uh, I think what we said to him is that it was his, without thinking about <laughs> it very well, I think what we said to him was it was, 
it was his job to to uh, administer this food thing that we didn't want to get involved in. And here we are right out of the bat. We're in it again. And the other side of it is, is I, I mean, the deed is done. And that's what seems to be the issue. Um, you know, maybe we're going about this the wrong way. Maybe we reimburse them if they turn in a slip rather than because, you know, it's like, what do you do? We have to pay this right, bill now. We can do. It's addressed to us, but do we charge him back for the boots or what do you do? I mean, this is, I like I said, it's out of my court. I feel that I just need to bring it to your attention and that's up to you guys what you do. Well, I'm afraid what we need to do is look at the damn thing again. I mean, here we are again. You're right. We're in a position we have to pay the bill. What are we going to do? He is paying he is paying the hundred dollars out of his own pocket for the for the amount that it's over the two hundred. Right. Yeah, but but what you're saying is what you I, I guess every time I read that damn thing, I read it I read it differently. But I thought it was a two hundred dollar boot allowance. I didn't realize it was two hundred dollars for one pair of boots. Is that what it says? It says no, up, they're it says allowed to, to buy one pair of boots each year each physical year, up to $200. Okay. Well, what, what, I would, what I would suggest, so the total bill, I looked at it this afternoon, but remind me what it is. The total bill was $300, and he paid $100? $300, he paid $100. The first pair of boots was $155, I think it was, and the second pair was, was the difference, be the $145. As okay. far as the AS to me, TME certification, um, that is, so that certification meets the standard. It's just an updated standard. I did look into that, um, Thank but you, it Andrew. does, it does not meet the, uh, height requirement that the town has in its policy for an eight inch, uh, an eight inch hike, like one of the pair of boots is just a pair of hikers. So it, it, it may or may not even come up over the ankle depending on the design of it. But as far as the like the the uh, the the toe reinforcement and that kind of stuff, which is what that that certification covers, it does meet that. Um, so a couple things at play is I, I agree with with Liz's comment that um, one again it comes down to you know purchasing your own your own stuff and approving it. Um, that's the biggest issue that I have. Um, and the policy does say that it needs to be pre-approved. So um, anyway, uh, I, think, I think in the in the in the future, he definitely anything that he can, <clears throat> he gets for himself, Victor should approve. Yeah. But I, in terms of in terms of this, I mean, I don't know what I don't know what we do about the eight inch thing. I don't even know if that's the right thing. That's what we've always had, but I don't know if it means anything or. It's important. Let, let me just finish, Sarah. Um, my my suggestion would be, I think he owes us the other forty five dollars, and then forty five. You mean the hundred and forty five dollar one? That, 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 that the town paid for the hundred and fifty five dollar pair of boots, and he paid forty five dollars, and he's already paid a hundred dollars for the other pair of boots. I I and think that's that. Like, that's I think that that's reasonable. You're paying, you're following the policy, except for the height requirement on the ankle. It is a six inch boot instead of the eight inch boot. Um, and, and we, I feel like we just push that conversation around the pre-approval and, and um, I mean, it, it, it seems like that's a fair compromise um, to me. Is there a possibility probably a distinct possibility that maybe they didn't have eight inch boots that fit him or that were available. Sarah, you want to say something? Well, you guys haven't identified who this person is at all during this meeting. Yes, we did. Have. Yeah, yeah we did. Dorinda, Dorinda pointed out it was Shane. Oh, okay. Sorry. I was like complete. I was thinking, well, who is this that we're talking about? All oh, right. Okay. Um, I, I would say Liz that, that, that style of boot, um, most likely had height availability, but that being said, 
everything's in scarce uh, supply these days, and and we weren't there, so we can't right. we can't really say. <laughs> I say, I I say we co we collect the forty five dollars from him. We inform him that you know he needs to have Vic sign off on it, whether it's uniforms or boots or whatever, anything anything that he's getting for his own use that uh, that Victor signs off on it and uh, and just. I, I think that's it, Dorinda. I couldn't believe it when that boot thing came up again. <laughs> I know, me neither. I was like, oh, my goodness. Oh. Yeah, and that's I honestly I do. don't think there's, there's anything know. malicious. There's nothing uh, like... Nobody's not saying no, anybody's no, I know. doing anything malicious, but I feel as though that, you know, we beat the horse to death once and then this happened, so... yeah. Is Victor? Victor isn't on here anymore. I'll I'll have a conversation with Victor, and either he or I will uh, will deliver that message to him, Dorinda. Okay. If everybody, if everybody agrees, and hopefully we're done with boots for a while. <laughs> Plus, they got caught in the mud, and then they have to get a new pair before the well, year is over. So, so I know it's late and everybody wants to go, but I was, I was thinking when I was thinking about these boots. So 30 years ago, as I'm crawling out the window of my three quarter ton pickup truck up the head of my driveway, cause I can't open the door cause I'm down so deep in the mud and getting ready to do the breaststroke or the backstroke across the mud to get to high ground. I tried to stand up. Well, guess what? A pair of my boots are down in the road up here at the end of my driveway. Maybe at some time they'll resurface, but as far as I know, they're still in there. Too much. There you go. Okay. Okay, so um, I would encourage everybody to look over that ARPA stuff that Dorinda, Dorinda sent out. Watch the, watch the movie if you can. I'll try and watch the whole thing. Dorinda, I didn't watch it all. Um, and really, really think about... Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the other thing we've got, we've got sitting out in the middle distance is we want to be sure, and I know we've got time, but if we're going to give any portion of that money to CB Fiber, we want to do it when, when they can get the matching funds. Uh, but, you know, can we, can we hold some of the money, money back in case we don't get this planning grant? I think probably we can, or at least for some period of time we can. I don't know whether we can squeeze squeeze that study in i mean we just have to yeah i want to be as creative as we can and get the most benefit that we can out of this money because never say it's a one-time thing there may be there may be other money but this is a big deal for us and it's a lot of money and i want to be sure we spend it well I'm yeah sure. and i think as far as the timing goes peter just as a reminder i'm pretty sure that the timing on this was it needs to be allocated by the end of 24 and spent by the end of 26 for this yeah. money. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but for the, the, um, I think the CV fiber thing was like, we had to do it by September or something. Yes. Like yes. And with the math on the CV fiber is that if every one of their, their towns or 21 towns were to allocate money to, um, to this, to, to them as from their ARPA money, that it would equate to if everyone did it, um, like seventy five thousand dollars. We could they they have enough for a seventy five thousand dollar match for everyone who gives seventy five thousand. Now, if somebody jumps in and says, "Well, we're going to give three hundred and they say, "Well, first, okay, you get the first three hundred, then that totally changes things. So, you know, there may be towns that give and don't get any match because the match was already used up. Or, you know, we could say, you know, it's sort of a good faith of like, well, if everybody did it, and we gave 75, we could be guaranteed 75. Not guaranteed, but. Right, 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 right. Yeah. But, I'm just, but I'm just saying it would be, it would be fool if we're, if we're thinking we're going to give some of the money, we might as well give it and try and get yes. them. Yes, I agree. That's all, that's all I'm saying. The other thing, the other thing I would just say is, like all of us, I've been watching these Fidium fiber ads on, uh, on the boob tube. And I couldn't figure out what they were or who they are. They're consolidated communications yep. is who they are. Yeah. 
and they're trying to light up Barry and Montpelier and grab up all the easy pickings they can uh, they can yep. grab. So anyway, I was kind of surprised. And to hear some that. of Middlesex, they they've already got um, middle some of Middlesex. Yeah, up East Hill, I think. Yeah, up East Hill is them. Well, it's it's going to be it's going to be quite a quite a turf war, but I don't think. I don't think I mean Fidium is definitely not going after the, the rural areas. They wanna they wanna grab the easy stuff. So consolidated is up to their old uh, their old tricks again, but they're they're out there doing it. Big time. So anyway. But I just again, I just wanna make sure we get the best benefit for our community that we can get out of this money. And if we can save some tax dollars, great. If we can do things that otherwise we would never be able to do, that's pretty good too. Uh, but we need to do it, and I want to be sure. And I know we've all agreed to this that we need to be having creating, which is the other thing we should talk about at that meeting, is creating a public process on this. Like whether we come up with a laundry list, and then we have then we have a couple of public hearings, or however we do it. Typically, as we know, and tonight was a good, tonight was another good example. We don't get much attendance at public hearings, but the fact of the matter, we need to do it and also uh, and also get the word out there, do a good job of getting the word out for whatever our draft proposal is on how to spend the money. I think we should do a survey too. you know, maybe give some ideas, but also have fill in the blank of what you think you or just say fill in the blank. <laughs> like, where would you like to see this money spent? Yep. The, 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 Yes, I, you're going to get a lot I, more I, from that, that than you are in a public. I don't, want, I don't want people spending a lot of time putting out a lot of crazy ideas for things that we can't use the money for. So, you know, as much as we know there's more flexibility than maybe we thought there was initially, Dorinda's right. There are limitations. So whatever we say is we say, you know, these are the these are the criteria that we have to meet for the eligible use of these funds or whatever. So we don't get. Uh, I mean, I don't know what ideas people are going to come up with, but I can promise you they'll come up with some Lulus. Anyway. Now what? I think that's enough for all of us for tonight, isn't it? It's enough for me. Did Sue Bettman want to say something? She arrived very late in the meeting, and I'm not sure if she came for a reason. I, I was interested in what... Yeah, Susan. Yeah, I, I was interested in what a curb cut was that the Melamed's wanted. Oh, it's just a driveway, so they can put it in a driveway. There's, oh, no, okay. there's no, there's no curb. <laughs> yeah, a curb out here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it, but but what there might be, and I and I don't know where it is. And Shane's the one who goes goes up and approves it. But if there's a need for a culvert, they have to put in a culvert of a certain size and this and that. There's some criteria and make it design it so that the water doesn't flow down the driveway into the town road. And, but there's yeah. definitely, it's called a curb cut, but there's no curb. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Okay, Susan. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't recognize you. No, that's it. I just. <laughs> have, a good, have a good evening. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Susan. okay. Sarah, do you have anything else? No, I just think that the board should know that our, our furnace is on the, is on the fritz. We've had borns out yesterday. And it's cold today, and I think I've got air conditioning coming from here. And the well, the consensus, the, I mean, the diagnosis was that there's water in the bottom of the furnace. It's rusted. Uh, he did what he could. I don't know what that means, um, but he said, I don't even think we can get parts for this thing anymore. Time to move to fossil fuels. Perfect time of year. Move to Deep fossil pump. fuels. Away from fossil fuels. Away from fossil fuels. I would like to. I would. I would like to. A pellet. Pellet furnace or Randy, you're going to help us with this. You're going to tell us. <laughs> heat pumps. It'd take a lot of work to heat this place with heat pumps. Oh, you'd, have, you'd, you'd have heat pumps, we'd have heat pumps lined up like cordwood. No, but yeah. I'm serious. This is the time that you do not go and replace it with an oil furnace. No. Not oil, no. it's it's gas. I mean, you could you can or get gas. I mean, look, here's the thing, guys, you know, once again, we're in a in problem here. You know, here we are trying to figure out where we're going to have our town hall. Now we're now we're already making expensive repairs to the existing town hall. I mean, I would suggest we at least band-aid the thing along through this heating season 
there and are not replaced. And, and Randy, I know you can help us with this, but they're they're pretty efficient uh, gas boilers and hot air gas things that you can get that are a lot better than that old thing we have. But we got to have heat. We have to look yeah. at our town plan, which is moving towards um, getting rid of fossil fuel technologies. So, well, we'll all I know is that Cheryl and I were so cold that we could that I could barely work. I have downtown. a space heater. I have an electric space heater. I'll bring it to you. I have an. I have an electric heat. Turn up the electric heat. Oh, I did. We've got electric heat. <laughs> so she wasn't that building. cold. So I turned. I went upstairs. <laughs> I have a you know, shawl you can borrow. Yeah, I just need I just need uh, maybe some of those Shane's boots because uh, the, it's the concrete down here. That's what really gets gets you in your bones and your elderly bones. We're I'm listening. We're listening. Uh, Madam Clark, we're there. listening. I mean, we have to have we have to have heat in the building, but I'm I'm not Thank in you. favor of spending fifty thousand dollars on a on a fancy, super efficient and 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 also I don't I don't think it would be good to have our town employees lugging forty pound bags of pellets and trying. They to don't. Feed. They get blown in. Well, you, but then you got to have a silo. Wait, wait till our neighbor finds out we're going to put up a big silo on the side of our building. Anyway, don't even, don't even need that today. Yeah, you don't. I mean, <laughs> you don't Dr. need that. Dr. Susan and Mark, they have a little like thing that it gets blown into their house. So, are you guys ready to adjourn? Yeah, I believe we are absolutely. But, but just to be, I mean, what is the re the the controls and the fan and everything else in the burner okay. are up off the ground. So why is, if it's rusty on the bottom, is it no good? It's inside. It's rusty. It's it's probably inside the heat exchanger, Peter. There's probably, probably what happened is that there ended up uh, producing some condensation somewhere. Um, and, and after time, the heat exchangers just yeah. wear out. Yeah. 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 Oh no. If there's, if there's a, if there are holes in the heat exchanger, the thing should be redlined. Yeah. I mean, by the sounds of it, if Lauren's been out here, you know, hopefully they've been monitoring, um, you know, what that thing's put out. But um, and and I I would guess that the town has active uh, carbon monoxide detectors and monitors with it in place. Um, so <laughs> you would think. We're, we're looking around. Oh, no. Yes. Keep looking. I, I I'm looking upstairs and I don't see any. So. <laughs> keep working um but no a, absolutely <laughs> and and on a serious note if they if we don't have any here we should go purchase a couple battery operated ones and get them put in place because if if the oh, heat Lord. exchanger is is bad we want to make sure it's a safe place to work so. well it's not i mean yesterday Cheryl, it, it, this place just smelled of fumes and everything it smelled bad yeah and i think <sighs> it's back to being bad so i got radon I got, I got carbon monoxide. It's amazing. Well, got any the, green cells get left? Get the radon fixed, Peter. What the hell? <laughs> okay. Get them in All there. right. Are you guys hey. done? I would yes, like to get so, out of the radon yes, propane would, office. Listen, in all in all seriousness, a <laughs> get the carbon monoxide detectors, <laughs> and b and b. <laughs> Yeah, call me if you pass out. No, you can't die. Okay, so please get the rate. Get get. The, want me to order some on Amazon? No, don't worry about it. It's okay. We've got our own Amazon account here. Thank you. Okay. But the other Tax thing rate. is, if if that thing is really that bad, and if it is, they would have they would have redlined it, right, Randy? I mean, they wouldn't allow it to even be on if it was dangerous. Or if 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 when they were doing their repairs, if they thought that there was a cracked heat exchanger there or something to that effect, they would have they would have uh, shut it down on you. Yeah, but that said, we certainly need to do something by next winter. Who knows? We might be in the state police barracks by next winter. Might be. I bet it's toasty warm down there. <laughs> Who knows? But we yes, we need to fix it. Okay. I'm declaring the meeting adjourned. I'm Randy is a committee of one to make sure that we have heat at the town hall. <laughs> Bye. Good night, everyone. Night, Randy, turn off the heat upstairs. Will do. Say thanks. Bye.